House Government Operations Subcommittee on Employment and Housing resumed their series of hearings investigating allegations of abuse and mismanagement in programs administered by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Testifying today before Chairman Tom Lantos of California and his colleagues was Carla Hills, now U.S. Trade Representative and a former Secretary at HUD. Subcommittee on Employment and Housing will please come to order. As we continue our hearings on abuse and mismanagement in programs administered by the Department of Housing and Urban Development, our witnesses today will be Ambassador Carla Hills, Secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development from 1975 to 1977, Hunter Cushing, former HUD Deputy Assistant Secretary for Multifamily Housing, and John Allen, the developer for the Durham Hosiery Mill Project. When the next edition of the Book of Lists is published, and the list is compiled of the most ill-advised ventures of the 1980s, on the top of this list of lemons, High above the introduction of the new Coca-Cola and the making of the film Heaven's Gate will be HUD co-insuring loans issued by DRG Funding Corporation. <coughs> to date, the American taxpayer has lost $69.5 million from DRG loans. The HUD Inspector General anticipates that by the time it is all over, the American taxpayer will lose an additional $300 million as a result of DRG loans. This subcommittee intends to broaden its investigation <clears throat> to find out how such a financial disaster could have occurred. By way of background, until 1983, all HUD insurance programs were handled exclusively by HUD without the involvement of any private coinsurance. As part of the privatization program, a coinsurance scheme was designed. Under this new program, at least theoretically, the private insurer assumed 19% of the risk, the taxpayer through HUD 81% of the risk. In point of fact, it seems that the taxpayer ended up with carrying all of the risk. In theory, with proper safeguards and responsible management by HUD, this program could have worked out. In April 1983, DRG was one of the first companies approved by HUD as a coinsurance lender. According to the regulations, it had to clear three demonstration projects, which it did. After that, DRG was in effect given a license to make loans co-insured by HUD. In plain English, Uncle Sam gave DRG his checkbook. We have all heard of crown jewels, but in this case, we are dealing with the crown lemon in the DRG mortgage portfolio, a giant project in Houston, Texas named Colonial House. The mortgage loan on this 1,818-unit project totaled $47.2 million in September 1984. But at a recent foreclosure sale, the property sold for only $8.9 million. HUD officials were aware of lax underwriting practices by DRG as early as 1984. Former HUD Assistant Secretary Maurice Barksdale, who will be testifying before us later this month, told subcommittee investigators that when he was informed that DRG was about to close on an 1,818-unit project, Colonial House in Houston, knowing how depressed the housing market was in Houston, he, and I'm quoting, almost fell out of his chair. 
at, end quote. Hunter Bourne, Barksdale executive assistant, described the project to subcommittee investigators as, I am quoting, active insanity, end quote. It was not realistic to expect to fill 1,818 units in the depressed economy that existed in Houston in 1984. They could not market that number of units even if they had used sweepstakes, telegrams, notifying recipients that they had won either a new car, a trip to Hawaii, or a cardboard set of luggage if they just agreed to visit Colonial House. Barksdale and others at HUD recognized this. According to Mr. Barksdale, they found to their dismay that under the applicable rules, they could not legally prevent the Colonial House project from closing. HUD officials continue to monitor DRG's activities, and they found serious breaches in program requirements. On November 13, 1984, Assistant Secretary Barksdale placed DRG on probation and required pre-commitment review and approval by HUD of all future projects. <clears throat> Barksdale's successor, Shirley Wiseman, testified last Friday that relying on the strong recommendation of HUD career staff, she rejected the request by DRG and its attorney, former HUD Secretary Carla Hills, to lift the pre-commitment approval requirement. Subsequently, HUD Secretary Pierce reversed Ms. Wiseman's decision and lifted this ban. We intend to find out why and how. Congressman Lukens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I share my colleagues' great sense of uh, despair and, and almost shock at the continuing unraveling of the HUD scandal. And I'm particularly impressed and astounded by the role of one person, the so-called executive secretary or executive assistant to the secretary, who apparently made all these things happen in the last several years of this administration. And I am looking forward eagerly to our witnesses today to find out how that role should properly be managed and how previous occupants of secretary's chair and undersecretary's positions held those executive assistants in check and what's missing in today's structure that obviously was in place in prior administrations that made it function more um, in the taxpayer's interest and the government's interest. Holding the position of, exec of the executive assistant to the secretary, Deborah Gordine was not required to be confirmed. And if you look at the organizational chart, nowhere in that chart is her position of executive assistant, and yet she apparently, for all practical purposes, was the acting secretary of HUD for a period of time. So during the course of these hearings, I will look forward eagerly to how that system is supposed to function and how those positions are supposed to be governed by other uh, bureaucratic committees or other positions so there's a balance and a check uh, the authority that, that obviously did run amok in the last several years. And I look forward to this testimony today, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the opportunity to share remarks. Thank you very much, Congressman Frank. Congressman Kyle. Mr. Chairman, I don't have any statement except that I would like to uh, uh, thank uh, Ambassador Hills for being here today, and I look forward to her testimony. Congressman <coughs> Chase. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have not usually had opening statements, and I just have a very brief remarks that I want to make. Uh, do Democrats, Republicans, unaffiliated voters, and those who don't even vote want this committee to do its job, and its job is to root out waste, fraud, and abuse. And with the help of the Inspector General and the administration, that's exactly what we are doing and are going to continue to do. This is a bipartisan effort because that's the only kind of effort a committee like this can function on. And I'd just like to say as a Republican member, one, I salute the job you're doing, Mr. Chairman. I have faith in what you're trying to do. I believe in the effort. I believe you've been doing it in a bipartisan way. And I also want to thank my Republican colleagues in this House who have done nothing but encourage me and the other members of this committee to do its job regardless of, of where the blame lies. I believe because of that, 
the work that we're going to do in this committee is going to be a very successful. And I might just like to say in conclusion that it's fun to have the ranking member of the full house to my right. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Congressman Shays. Over the course of many years, <clears throat> long before I got on this committee, uh, the House Government Operations Committee attained great national recognition for its relentless pursuit of wrongdoing in government. The overwhelming bulk of the credit for the achievements of that committee go to two individuals, the former chairman of that committee, Chairman Brooks of Texas, and the ranking Republican member, my good friend and distinguished colleague, Congressman Horton. He has done more than probably anyone in a fair, objective, nonpartisan fashion to ferret out wrongdoing in government. It gives me extraordinary pleasure to introduce my good friend, the ranking Republican of the full committee, Congressman Horton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm very pleased to join with you here today for your continuing hearing <clears throat> on past mismanagement and abuse at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. I've been on this committee, Mr. Chairman, as you've indicated, for a long time, actually 27 years. I, when I first came to Congress, I was assigned to the committee, and uh, during those years, uh, many uh, efforts have been made by this uh, committee to ferret out waste, fraud, and abuse. Uh, in the early days, all we had was the um, oversight of the various committees, including the Government Operations, which is the oversight committee of the House. And then more recently, as a result of legislation introduced by Mr. Brooks and myself, we instituted the uh, Inspector General process, which I think is working and working well. We've seen many instances in which Inspectors General have ferreted out waste and fraud and abuse. And last year, uh, the Office of Management and Budget testified that as a result of their work in the last 10 years, uh, that uh, they had saved over $20 billion for that 10 years. Uh, I want to take this opportunity as a ranking Republican on this committee to commend you and your committee for what you're doing to ferret out waste, fraud, and abuse here in this uh, problem uh, at, at HUD. And I look forward to working with you and the full, uh, at the full committee level with respect to the recommendations and reports that, that your subcommittee will, will produce. Mr. Chairman, I'm especially uh, grateful to you for the opportunity to introduce today one of the witnesses, uh, the United States Trade Representative, Amb Ambassador Carla Hills. <laughs> Ambassador Hills is a <clears throat> most distinguished public servant of the highest integrity and sound character. I've had the great p uh, uh, pleasure and privilege of working with her in different capacities for more than 15 years. I know her well and I respect her greatly. Her record of public service is a truly impressive one. Ambassador Hills was sworn in as the United States Trade Representative on February 6, 1989. As a member of President Bush's cabinet, Ambassador Hills is the President's principal advisor on international trade policy. During the Ford administration, she served as Secretary of Housing and Urban Development and was the third woman ever appointed to a cabinet post. Because of her work at the Department of Housing and Urban Development, Time Magazine named her as one of its 10 Women of the Year in 1976. For two years, 1974 to 75, prior to the time she served as Secretary of HUD, she served as Assistant Attorney General of the Civil Division of the Justice Department. And prior to these positions, she was assistant United States attorney in Los Angeles. In addition, she taught antitrust law at UCLA, and was a co-founder of a major Los Angeles law firm. When not serving in the government, <clears throat> she's had a distinguished career as a private attorney. From 1986 to 1988, she was the managing partner of the, D of the DC office of Weil, Gottschall, and Manjis. Prior to that, from 78 to 86, <clears throat> she was a partner in the law firm of Latham and Watkins. Mr. Chairman, Ambassador Hills 
is a recognized expert in the field of housing and urban development. She served as Vice Chairman of President Reagan's Commission on Housing from 81 to 82. She also co-chaired with former House Banking Committee Chairman Henry Royce, who served incidentally on this committee at one time, the National Low-Income Housing Preservation Commission. And she chaired the Urban Institute, a nonprofit research and educational organization that analyzes housing and community development issues. During her tenure, Secretary of HUD, Ambassador Hills developed the Urban Homesteading Program in coordination with local neighborhood preservation efforts. She established a mortgagee review board. She provided strong direction, restoring credibility to HUD's mission and improving overall housing strategy. She greatly upgraded planning, control, and evaluation capabilities at HUD by implementing a personnel program that emphasized skills and motivation. Mr. Chairman, Ambassador Hills is an intelligent, ethical, and honest person, and she's a successful lawyer. No lawyer should be tainted by the wrongdoings of his or her clients, which is why I'm so pleased that you've given Ambassador Hills the opportunity to testify here today. <clears throat> Press reports have intimated a connection between her professional work and abuses at HUD. This connection is unfounded and I'm pleased that she will have the opportunity to set the record straight. Mr. Chairman, thank you once again for the opportunity to say a few words about my good friend and one outstanding public servant. Ambassador Hills believes in the programs you're investigating, and I know she applauds your efforts to get the, to the bottom of any mismanagement and abuse of HUD programs. I'm sure her testimony will be a welcome part of this subcommittee's efforts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to the hearing. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Horton, and uh, let me just state for the record, and I will have some things to say about Ambassador Hills, the chair fully associates himself with your comments of uh, commendation and praise for the most distinguished public service Ambassador Hills has rendered our nation uh, during the course of so many years. Before calling on her, I'd like to call on the balance of our colleagues that just arrived, Congressman Martinez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no statement at this time. I'm very interested in listening to Ms. Hill and finding out exactly what... Uh, Congressman Weiss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no opening statement. Congressman Schumer. No Congressman Morrison. <clears throat> Ambassador Hills, uh, uh, let me just say that in your uh, brief tenure as Special Trade Representative, uh, you have earned the bipartisan trust and confidence of my colleagues and myself, uh, both in the House and in the Senate. Uh, you are a tough negotiator. You are representing the interests of the United States in this most important arena, effectively and intelligently and with distinction, and we are all in your debt. Let me also say, uh, before asking you to begin your testimony, that as a matter of courtesy to the President and members of his cabinet, um, the, the chair does not swear in individuals in their capacities as sitting members of the cabinet. But I will have to ask you to take the oath because what we are dealing with is your work during the course, that, your, during the course of time that you were not a member of the cabinet but uh, dealt with the Department of Housing and Urban Development. So if you have no objections, I would like to ask you to rise. Raise your right hand. You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Please be seated. <clears throat> uh, Secretary Hills, we are stating for the record that you are appearing, of course, on a voluntary basis. I know I'm speaking for all members of the subcommittee on both sides of the aisle in expressing our appreciation for your cooperation. You are one of uh, uh, the nation's leading experts on housing. Uh, my colleague and friend uh, uh, listed only a small segment of your many contributions to this arena. You're also a distinguished attorney, and I'm sure you'll be able to shed light both on specific issues involving uh, DRG and coinsurance, 
and on the general question of the functioning of HUD uh, during the course of recent years. Your entire prepared statement will be entered in the record. Um, you may proceed in any way you choose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank I, you, I just would like to ask you to pull the mic very, very close to you because it's, it's voice activated and we want to be sure everybody hears you. I think it needs to come a bit closer. Let's see if this works. I think it's on, but it has to be closed. Thank you, Mr. Horton. You're absolutely right. It was not on. And thank you for your very kind comments. Mr. Chairman and members of this committee, as former Secretary of HUD and as an admirer of the agency's mission and its many dedicated professionals, I cannot help but be saddened by the revelations that this committee quite properly has brought to light. Fraud, abuse, mismanagement, these have no place in meeting HUD's mission of housing the nation's poor. They certainly had no place in the HUD we ran 15 years ago. When we met in private last week, Mr. Chairman, you told me that your purpose in calling me was to testify, to give me an opportunity to share whatever information I might have regarding the operations of the programs under scrutiny. I am very pleased to do whatever I can to help, although in the years following my tenure as secretary, my occasional dealings with HUD were purely in my capacity as a lawyer, representing clients to the best of my ability on the merits of their cases. My years of government service are a matter of public record. My involving with housing matters, however, did not end with my tenure at HUD. From 1977 to 1989, I donated several thousand hours to housing and urban issues. And Mr. Horton has recited some of the commissions and other areas in which I have served. Since I have practiced law extensively between my assignments in government, I am acutely aware of the special responsibilities of a lawyer who has held public trust and returned to private practice. For an entire year after leaving HUD, I not only did not practice before that agency, as now required by law, I did not practice at all. And during this self-imposed moratorium, I served as co-chair to the Alliance to Save Energy, a nonprofit organization that promotes energy conservation. Upon returning to private practice in 1978, I abided by a few basic common sense rules when representing clients before HUD or any other agency. I did not seek any action from a former agency unless I believed that I would grant the same action were I the agency official. I did not accept a client if I had reason to believe that the client kept, came to me expecting to obtain an inappropriate result. I accepted only fees that were consistent with the high standards of ethics of the firms with which I was associated. And finally, I was careful not to center my legal practice on my prior government experience. Indeed, of the roughly 20,000 hours I have billed to a wide variety of clients as a partner in two highly regarded national law firms, my representations before HUD accounted for a minor portion. Mr. Chairman, when we met in your office last week, you indicated that the committee is interested in my representations before HUD, particularly with respect to DRG Financial Corporation, which retained my law firm in a matter involving HUD, the HUD co-insurance program. I'm pleased to lay out now publicly, just as I did for you privately, the facts of that representation. Those facts show that consistent with the foregoing principles, my law firm was retained because of my expertise as a housing lawyer. I began by addressing my client's problems with HUD staff level professionals. When after considerable time and work, no resolution had been obtained, I appealed to the secretary. In so doing, I based that appeal strictly on the merits, not on party, personal relationship, or pecuniary interest. And in the end, having obtained some, but not all, of what my client sought, my law firm was compensated for its seven months of work at its normal hourly rate in a manner entirely consistent with the highest standards of the legal profession. 
Beginning in 1981, the firm, then 175 lawyers, with which I was associated, Latham and Watkins, did very occasional legal work for DRG. I was pleased to undertake the legal re representation because DRG's chairman, George DeFranco, was well known to me as a widely admired leader in the housing field. Mr. DeFranco had chaired the National Corporation for Housing Partnerships for over a decade, and his firm had been a leader in the mortgage insurance field for years. Until 1984, our firm spent less than an estimated 50 hours each year giving incidental legal advice to DRG. We were not their outside law firm. We had no knowledge of their overall legal problems or their financial condition. In November 1984, DRG sought our assistance after being, an advi being advised in a letter that you mentioned from HUD Assistant Secretary for Housing, Maurice Barksdale, that uh, DRG's procedure for authorizing commitments as a co-insurer under the Section 223F program were faulty with respect to three projects, and that as a result, DRG's further underwriting of co-insurance loans would require pre-commitment approval from HUD. For the next three months, DRG personnel worked directly with HUD personnel to correct the cited defects, and DRG submitted eight loans to HUD for review prior to commitment. During this period, my law firm advised DRG to get with it, to sit down on a case-by-case -case basis with HUD until DRG got it right. Of the eight loans submitted, HUD approved six. DRG voluntarily withdrew two for business reasons. Although DRG's submissions were in fact being cleared, the delay inherent in the process put DRG at a serious competitive disadvantage. In February 1985, I wrote to Mr. Barksdale's successor, Acting Assistant Secretary Shirley Weissman, seeking to discuss DRG's problem. Another attorney from my firm and I subsequently met with Mrs. Weissman and several other HUD personnel. Mrs. Weissman indicated that instead of dealing with DRG's problem individually, it might be preferable to develop broad criteria applicable to all lenders that would identify the kinds of loans, for example, those in markets with high vacancy rates, that would require pre-commitment approval from HUD. DRG staff then worked with the HUD staff to develop such broad criteria. But during the next six weeks, the hopeful for broad criteria were not proposed, and the approval process virtually stopped. In April 1985, five months after we began our effort, I wrote to Secretary Pierce. I explained DRG's problem, described the unsuccessful joint effort to develop industry-wide criteria, and suggested that the pre-commitment approval be converted to a post-commitment audit, combined perhaps with industry-wide criteria such as pre-clearance of loans in soft markets. I requested and was granted a meeting at which one of my partners and I met with a secretary and many other HUD personnel. During this meeting of about one hour, I presented DRG's case in some detail strictly on the merits. In mid-May, almost three weeks after our meeting, Secretary Pierce sent a nine-page detailed tough letter to DRG specifying, spe specifying each of HUD's concerns about the content of the DRG submissions and specifying as precisely the steps that DRG would have to take to continue in the program. He advised that HUD was releasing DRG from the requirement that HUD review each case prior to issuance of a commitment, but expressly stated that after commitment, HUD would review each case in exactly the same close manner as it had been reviewing them for the past 24 weeks. Secretary Pierce's letter also expressly stated that DRG's approval as a co-insurance lender would be completely withdrawn if DRG de deviated from the guidelines of his nine-page letter or from other regulatory or handbook requirements. Secretary Pierce's letter did change the procedure from a careful pre-commitment scrutiny to a careful post-commitment scrutiny, but it did not lift the restrictions on DRG. 
Moreover, these procedures by no means relieved either DRG or HUD from the responsibility for ensuring sound underwriting practices. They certainly did not relieve HUD from maintaining the close scrutiny promised by the Secretary. Mr. Chairman, I did occasionally represent other clients before HUD, and there have been stories in the press that I represented a Florida developer in connection with the Section 8 moderate rehabilitation program. In 1987, I did accept representation of Sweezy Realty, Inc., after the executive director of the Broward County Housing Authority wrote to me to say that Mrs. Sweezy was working with him to bring much-needed low-income housing to South Florida, which was experiencing an acute housing shortage due to an influx of immigration. Over a 16-month period, I spent considerable time engaging in standard legal representation on behalf of Sweezy Realty and in support of the efforts first of the Broward and later the Dade County Housing Authorities. Our firm was partially successful. HUD ultimately approved 233 of 400 requested units for Broward County and 75 of 150 requested units for Dade County. The Broward County Housing Authority awarded its units to Sweezy Realty. The Dade units have not been awarded to Sweezy, and I do not know whether they have been awarded. I have supplied in much greater detail on this and other representations before HUD in my written uh, testimony. All of my representations before HUD, which comprised a relatively small portion of my overall practice, involved the same thorough legal work as my representations of DRG and Sweezy Realty. In each instance, my law firm was hired because we were experienced housing lawyers, we worked as lawyers, and we were paid as lawyers. When not able to obtain for my client what I considered to be appropriate action at a lower level within HUD, I occasionally appealed to a, an appropriate higher level. In each instance, I argued my client's case strictly on the merits. And as far as I know, the decisions were rendered strictly on the merits. As for the allegations of fraud and abuse that are the subject of this committee's investigation, I have no personal knowledge. I do know this, however, in agencies such as HUD, where every day they are responsible for allocating large sums of money, there is always the possibility of fraud and abuse. That is why it is so very important to have hands-on management, a vigorous inspector general, and a rigorous oversight apparatus. And it heartens me that this committee and Secretary Kemp so clearly understand the importance of these safeguards and of ensuring adherence to the highest possible ethical standards in keeping with the public trust. Mr. Chairman, I'm very happy to answer yours or any of the committee members' questions. Well, let me thank you very much for your statement, Secretary Hills. <clears throat> I would like to ask my colleague on both sides, if I may, since these issues are very complex, that if it's agreeable to all of them, we restrict the first round of questioning to coinsurance and DRG, then move on to um, the second issue raised by Secretary Hills, um, moderate rehab, and then deal with any other issue any member uh, wants to deal with. This will enable all of us to focus in a systematic fashion on these issues. Secretary Hills, I would like to deal with the issue of coinsurance, a company called DRG, the Colonial House Project, and your role in all of this. Uh, let me perhaps set the stage and ask you to comment whether my summary is accurate. Prior to 1983, insurance by HUD was done entirely by itself. Is that correct? Yes, I believe that's correct. And in 83, a so-called coinsurance program was designed, which theoretically placed 81% of the taking of the risk on HUD and 19% on the private 
co-insurer. Yes. But in a sense, that was only a, 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 a theoretical sharing of the risk in instances such as, for instance, Colonial House, because when Colonial House um, went into default and HUD in, had HUD insisted on getting that 21, that 19 percent from the private insurer, in this case DRG, DRG could not have complied because it didn't have the resources to pay its 19 percent of that huge loan. And DRG would have gone belly up in 1985. Now, you were not at HUD at that time, and I'm merely asking your opinion as to whether my reading of this case is accurate or not. Would you agree with me on that? I don't know what the financial condition of DRG was at the time that you mentioned. You make the allegation it would have gone belly up if it uh, uh, had to pay off on a particular loan. I do not know the fact. I, I cannot respond. Very good. Well, let me help you a little bit. What happens, of course, in these so-called co-insurance schemes that Jeannie May comes into the picture and all of the insured amounts become government insured. Isn't that basically correct? I believe so. So while we are talking about sharing the risk, in, in cases of real trouble, such as DRG found itself, the entity which ends up holding the bag is the American taxpayer. Is that correct? If the 20% lender goes into bankruptcy, yes, the, America, uh, the, uh, uh, the Ute loan is fully insured, and it, the, uh, uh, the Treasury has to pick up the balance. Do you know, Secretary Hills, and you were out of government, there is no reason why you necessarily should, what the capitalization requirement was that DRG and others had to meet? No. It was a million and a half dollars plus 2% of the loans, which means that it seems to the chairman that DRG, for instance, was dramatically undercapitalized to assume the kind of risks that it theoretically assumed. <coughs> This is just to establish the framework in which, in which DRG operated. It, is, uh, it has now become sort of part of the conventional wisdom that coinsurance meant that HUD assumed 81% of the risk and the private lender insured nine, assumed 19% of the risk. But in fact, that is not the case when there is a big project the lender is undercapitalized, as clearly DRG was, because then clearly the government ends up assuming all of the risk. That's the point I was making, and I take it you basically agree with that. Well, I agree that the government backs the uh, private lender if it goes into bankruptcy. And you would hope that the private lenders would be sufficiently scrutinized so that they were pro uh, projected not to go into bankruptcy. That, that is correct. Now let's deal with DRG specifically. Uh, in order to qualify uh, for being designated as a co-insurer, the prospective co-insurer, in this case DRG, had to qualify three so-called pilot projects. And DRG did that, and DRG was accepted into the program as a co-insurer, is that correct? Correct. DRG was accepted as a co-insured lender on April 22, 1983. On September 10, 1984, DRG originated a $47,200,000 loan for the Colonial House project, September 10, 1984. And a few weeks later, on October 29, 
The Inspector General of HUD initiated an internal audit using DRG as a sample lender. Two lenders were included in that audit, DRG and York, and these two constituted 95% of the loans in the program at that time. On November 13, 1984, the Assistant Secretary for Housing, Mr. Maurice Barksdale, wrote a letter to DRG about serious breaches of program requirements at Colonial House, Georgetown Apartments, and Palm Lake Apartments, all projects of DRG, and the action taken by Mr. Barksdale on November 13, 1984, was to put DRG on probation and require of DRG a pre-commitment review of all cases for which the firm wanted to make loans. Now, this is an item of uh, great importance. I'm giving you copies of what I'm reading from uh, okay. Ms. Hills. Thank you very much. You're most welcome. Um, I have in my hand and you have in your hand a letter from Mr. Barksdale, Assistant Secretary of Housing, to Mr. Donald de Franceau, President of DRG Funding Corporation. This gentleman, by the way, is not the gentleman you were talking about, but his son, I take it. Correct. You made some very laudatory remarks about Mr. George de Franceau, and our inquiries in the industry certainly support your very high regard for Mr. George de Franceau. Would you care to characterize at this stage the reputation Mr. Donald de Franceau enjoyed in the industry? I had not met Mr. The, the son until his father brought him in in 1984, and uh, I had no reason at that time to have anything other than uh, high regard for the son. And uh, you are asking me at this juncture, all I know is that things have become very troubled since 1984 and the present time. But I have, ne I have never seen a, uh, uh, a report that would attack the integrity of Mr. Donald DeFranco. And never in the course of my representation of uh, DRG was there ever a hint from HUD that he or his company were involved in fraud or intentional wrongdoing. Now, the letter that we are both looking at <clears throat> from Mr. Barksdale, who is the responsible official assistant secretary, um, is a two-page letter. Um, and in essence, it raises some very serious questions about the practices of DRG. It says about the Houston project, this project is ineligible for insurance. He says the occupancy rate only about 200 units were occupied out of 1,800 units, which is 10 percent. He says an absorption rate of three to four units a day would have to be realized for them to fill up. And in the Houston market at that time, that was, according to Mr. Barksdale, unjustifiably optimistic to expect this rent-up rate at the rents used in your underwriting on their current Houston housing market conditions. Two, he says, in order for this project to meet hot programmatic requirements, rents would have to be reduced by amounts that could attract the absorption reflected above. The reduced rents would, of course, result in a significantly reduced mortgage amount and property value. <clears throat> Assuming HUD were willing to waive the requirements for a sustaining occupancy within 12 months after endorsement, a more realistic rent-up period of three to five years and the establishment of a three-year operating deficit escrow would have to be recognized in the processing. 
but Mr. Barksdale is saying this place is 90% empty. And given the housing conditions and the real estate market in Houston today, at the rates you are charging for these apartments, you're not going to fill it. So you would have to drastically reduce the rents and your expectation of filling up this apartment house of 1,818 units won't take a year, it will take three to five years. And during that period, you will have a huge loss. Point three, there are serious underwriting deficiencies relating to your determination of the value of the property. What that means in English, you, Mr. De so dramatically overvalued this property. This property is not worth nearly as much as you claim it is worth. And the rents greatly exceed the determinations arrived at by the headquarters appraiser. Next point. All of the required repairs were not completed prior to endorsement, and some units were not ready for occupancy. Neither the regulations nor the handbook instructions permit repairs on refinancing transactions to be completed after endorsement, unless the repairs cannot be completed because of weather conditions. Weather was not a factor in this case. He lists lots of problems. And then the concluding paragraph. The instances cited above are considered serious breaches of the authority granted you under the 223F coinsurance program. You are therefore advised that until further notice in accordance with chapter, etc., your authority to underwrite coinsurance loans independent of our review is hereby suspended as of the date of receipt of this letter effective immediately. All cases for which you have not issued a firm commitment must be sent to this office for review and approval of the complete processing, including same documentation as was required for a review of the first three cases prior to issuance of the commitment. Sincerely, Maurice Barksdale, Assistant Secretary. Now, Secretary Hills, as I read this letter, as any rational, intelligent person would read this letter, this letter is dynamite. This letter tells GRD, this is a brand new program, we started it a year ago. You got admitted into this program by passing the minimal qualifications of handling three projects. But we are looking at this Houston case, which the hot people locally call active insanity, active insanity. And you, DRG, Mr. DeFranco, have just done a preposterous job of underwriting. You have inflated the value. You have not completed all of the repairs on all of the apartments. You have set rents, which are way above that would allow the filling of this place. And this is so unacceptable, this is so egregious, that we are going to lift your privilege of writing any more loans unless we, before you make any more loans, tell you it's all right for you to sign off on a loan. We, in a sense, are taking back Uncle Sam's checkbook. Mr. Barksdale also says to committee investigators, and I suspect uh, here under oath in a few days, that the only reason he did not cancel this project was that by law he had no right to do so. DRG had Uncle Sam's checkbook. And until they were put on notice, as he did in this letter, however crazy, however irresponsible, however potentially fraudulent 
however potentially fraudulent their actions were, Mr. Barksdale had his hands tied, couldn't act. Now, in our private meeting, Madam Secretary, you referred to the problems of DRG as technical violations. I'm wondering, in view of reading this letter now, do you still feel that these were technical violations or that they were, as Mr. Barksdale indicates, serious breaches of the authority granted you on their coinsurance program? I think that they are serious. Um, let me talk a little bit about Please. Them. First of all, Mr. Barksdale could have given notice of termination were he of the view that uh, these violations were so egregious that the company should not continue to have, as you put it, Uncle Sam's checkbook. As uh, uh, the remedy here is to put the party on notice and then hold a hearing because uh, uh, er anyone who has built a business around a HUD program is entitled to a hearing. And, uh, as, and, and so Mr. Barksdale could have given notice saying instead of having a uh, pre-commitment review, uh, we would like to have to terminate you in the coinsurance program for violations and to have a hearing. Let, he, me, let me comment, if I may, forgive me for interrupting you. Yes. Uh, let me stipulate obviously for the record the point that my distinguished friend Congressman Horton made. We are clearly not holding you responsible for whatever serious breaches DRG may be guilty of. Mr. Barksdale's uh, uh, statement is, and he will come in and testify to this, that in a sense he couldn't stop payment on the Colonial House check, that the general counsel at that time so advised him. That was the essence of the program that once three projects were completed, DRG, York, the others, had Uncle Sam's checkbook. They were expected to deal with Uncle Sam's checkbook with prudence and caution and, uh, and honesty. But when apparently they didn't, as they palpably didn't in the case of Colonial House, where DRG arranged a 47 plus million dollar loan and the government just ended up selling this whole property for less than nine million dollars so it wasn't great prudent investing underwriting <coughs> the only thing that uh, that mr barksdale at this point could do was to insist on pre-clearance in the future but i interrupted you uh, well you're right, he couldn't correct the problem of Colonial House. That's the only point I, I think I'm we making. have several issues here, and I, and I really want to uh, be clear about it. Please. Um, the Colonial House has a bill of particulars that sounds fairly se severe, and we could deal with that. Um, the DRG mm -hmm. personnel made representations to HUD personnel after they got the Barksdale letters that says, as to your first point with respect to the absorption rate uh, was only three or four units that an absorption rate I think as you put it would be uh, three or four units a day to rent up by the time that it was required to rent up uh, their response w uh, was well the rent up is ahead of schedule uh, actually we are renting up 4.8 units per day uh, on the second well, over what period of time had they done that the project would have been a success it wouldn't have gone belly exactly up. and of course you're absolutely right we're looking at a tragic situation where the project went under but we must be clear about the time we're looking at it when mr. Barksdale wrote his letter he could do nothing about the pro the, pro the loan had been made uh, the government was obligated under the insured loan uh, the the government could say, well, because this is so serious, we will terminate so there will be no future loans. We will hold a hearing and give this company the right to come in and present evidence as to whether it has egregiously violated the handbook and the regulations, 
or whether we're wrong and our appraisers our appraisals are wrong uh, <coughs> that would have taken care of the future but you're right they were legally obligated on the colonial house uh, when I think your question to me is weren't these just very very egregious violations yes the bill of particulars sounds quite serious I'm just telling you that HUD and the DRG personnel had six months of conversations where there was a back and forth on how serious these violations were and as I say there were responses in each area I'm not arguing their case well, uh, we am, know what the outcome was. I am was. awfully happy you are not arguing their case because I, I'd like to share with you a memorandum which Mr. Thomas Demery wrote, who at that time worked as a consultant for HUD, to Mr. Egan, who I believe was a HUD official. And the subject is site visit to Colonial House Apartments, Houston, Texas. This, this sounds almost like a bad movie. It's, it sounds like a, a sort of an unbelievably phony promotional scheme. <laughs> uh, he went to the site and he says, my site visit occurred at 7.30 p.m. Tuesday, May 21, 1985. Do you have a copy of this memo? We'll send you one down. Three rental agents were on duty and all seemed helpful, knowledgeable, and friendly. One of them, Starla, showed me vacant units and models while going through her sales pitch. The buildings and grounds appeared to be in excellent physical condition, and Starla indicated that 19 leases had been signed over the previous weekend. The weekend promotional event was a Hawaiian party, with the first place prize being a trip to Hawaii. When I wrote my introduction, I didn't know this, but in fact they were peddling these apartments by offering trips to Hawaii. The party plus the resumption of media promotions was credited for the recent leasing activity. What, what we are dealing with is a, is a disaster. Yes. And the disaster <clears throat> is so serious that for the first time in the history of HUD and the co-insurance program, the responsible HUD official, Mr. Barksdale, says, you, DRG, cannot make any more loan commitments involving Uncle Sam's checkbook. Now, it is at this point that you enter the picture, is that correct? That's correct. Can you describe uh, for the subcommittee, Secretary Hills, with whom did you deal at HUD with respect to the Colonial House Project? I didn't deal with a colonial house project. What we did was tell DRG to deal with the grievances specified in the Barksdale letter. And so HUD personnel, the technical personnel, dealt with DRG's personnel. We provided the legal analysis as to issues <coughs> such as there, there was a problem with the cash reserve. What do the regulations require with respect to a cash reserve? There was a complaint with respect to uh, uh, the repair escrow. We analyzed the regulations to determine what were the HUD requirements to comply with the uh, repair escrow, but we did not get into, nor did we have the capacity to get into, the uh, underwriting analysis. But we urged DRG to sit down with HUD on a case-by-case -case basis and work out these problems that had been enumerated. Well, Secretary Hills, it seems to me, <coughs> please correct me if I'm wrong, that the issues were overwhelmingly non-legal in character. They were policy issues, they were underwriting issues, they were judgmental issues. Mr. Barksdale letter clearly says, you inflated the value of the property. That's not a legal matter. If, if the market in Houston in 1984 says that the value of Colonial House is 25 million and DRG claims it's 50 million, you don't need a lawyer to deal with that. That is a question of market determination, a competent appraiser 
and Mr. Barksdale letter clearly refers to that. I quote, there are serious under, point three, there are serious underwriting deficiencies relating to your determination of the value of the property and the processing of rents, both of which greatly exceed the determinations arrived at by headquarters appraiser. There is not a word about legal complications here. No, but Mr. Barksdale letter says, DRG dramatically inflated the value of this property. I know why they did it. I'll come to that in a few minutes. They had their own sweet reasons for dramatically inflating the value of the property. They obviously wanted to bail out the people who had loans on this property prior to HUD being sucked into this swamp. That's why they did it. That's clear. That's clear. They inflated the rents because only these inflated rents could possibly meet the mortgage. And because they inflated the rents, they couldn't rent the apartments. I mean, you have to be neither an economist, nor, nor a lawyer, nor an appraiser. You, you need no professional qualifications to understand what happened. They inflated the value of this place to justify a high mortgage, to justify high fees for themselves. They knew they were taking no risks anyway, because the risks in the final analysis is taken by Jeannie May Hod, FHA, the American taxpayer. They bloated this, they set the rents, the apartments were not being leased. So when Mr. Demery goes to visit, they're offering him and others who look at it a trip to Hawaii. And the, re the responsible official at HUD says, you did such an abominable job in abusing your public responsibility by having temporary possession of Uncle Sam's checkbook that we are not going to let you do this again. That was the issue. That was the issue that you were called in on. Now, we had uh, uh, Ms. Weisman. Uh, did you meet with Mr. Barksdale? I believe I did. And well, maybe I didn't. I don't. Uh, I don't know whether we met. I, I have to believe that we may have met. Uh, I know exactly who he is. But right. uh, and, and you either met with him or talked to him by telephone. You believe. One I, or the other? I believe that I may have. Um, we don't have the records, and so I'm trying to refresh my recollection. Uh, I appreciate that. Through uh, talking to other people who were at meetings or in the letters that I can get, like the ones you handed to me. And uh, uh, I would like to return to your issue, if you would Please. permit me. Please. When you look at the letter and you say, these are, these are appraisal facts, these have nothing to do with the law. The implication is that the company didn't need a lawyer. You're right that Mr. Barksdale did recite some terrible facts. And that happens in a murder case, too. You get your bill of particulars, and it says you have done all these things. The fact that your bill of particulars set forth very ugly facts doesn't mean that the accused doesn't need a lawyer. Well, I am happy. They we, sure needed a lawyer, well, Mrs. We were, Sills. I fully agree with you on that. We were retained because the company's livelihood, its life, was at stake. I'm not here to apologize for them, but as I said, the remedy for HUD, there were several remedies. One is to put them, as you put it, on probation and require all loans to be put through them on a one-by-one -one basis, or if you really believe they were so egregious, to just stop and say, this program won't work with you. We'll give you a hearing if you think this is unfair, but this is our bill of particulars, and we'll have an administrative law judge, and then you have your appeal into court to determine whether we're right or we're wrong. I do want to put some balance in this, though, because bills of particulars are often very, very severe. And they're, it's like reading the plaintiff's brief, and you say, yes, 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 and you think you're captured. And then you read the defendant's brief, and you think, oh, my. There is a different light to this. Absolutely. And uh, when the, the client came to see us and was, I, I was like you. What is the answer here? You're going to have to work with HUD. There were answers that they proffered. Now, hindsight is perfect, and you are right. The project didn't work. 
but at this time, it was a new program, they were working out the bugs, there were some answers. I don't know whether you're interested in my sharing them with you, but it makes the allegations of the Bill of Particulars look very, very much less serious Please. than the way they have Please. been articulated here. Please. And I don't know what the facts were because you're right. I wasn't sweeping together the facts. I was looking at the regulatory procedure, the administrative law procedure, if you will. But as I started to say, that on the rent up, there was an allegation that you couldn't possibly rent up until 1985, as you have committed to do. The response was, well, we're already renting up ahead of schedule. And but you that said was that a what phony, That was a phony statement, which, which I suspect could have stemmed from the fact that they put on a full court press with trips to Hawaii and I don't know what else they were giving away. And they said, well, this last weekend we, we rented X number of units and at this rate, at this rate, you know, we're gonna have it uh, filled up in a few months. This is like saying when you go on a reducing diet and you, you know, you're 100 pounds overweight and the first day you lose three pounds and you say at this rate in 30 days I lose 100 pounds. It doesn't work that way. But we know uh, what we know at a given time and uh, it seems to me that uh, at November through, uh, say, February, the parties were working back and forth, rather in a ping-pong fashion, arguing about whether or not the rent up. But let's go through the other things, because, for example, the rents would have to be reduced to achieve the absorption rate, uh, or you have to develop a larger uh, operating deficit. Well, the response there was, uh, the rents have been rented at the rents used in the underwriting, and we have a $7 million cash reserve. Now, I don't know whether the facts were correct or not, uh, maybe here I should tell you what I recall of the philosophy of the coinsurance program. Uh, in the old days, the, ins the government insured 100% of multifamily projects, and they got very far behind. So far behind that there was thought to be some very poor underwriting practices. In fact, at one time, HUD was called the slumlord of the nation because it had taken back, because of very poor underwriting practices, so many multifamily projects. And many people in the housing industry thought that the underwriters in the private sector did a better job, but that the government could not attract them in to do the underwriting for the government. We didn't pay enough. For whatever reason, we didn't have the capacity to bring in sufficient backroom authority to do good underwriting. And the notion got started that, and it makes conceptual sense, that if the private underwriter, if the private lender would take 20% of the risk, that that would be a big enough hook to make them be very, very careful in their underwriting, and it would relieve the government from having to do from ground zero up through the project underwriting, but could do a one out of 10 and, and sit at the desk and just read the material to see whether or not the underwriting made sense. In other words, with a much smaller team, a SWAT team, you could oversee a coinsurance program. That's actually how it got started. And my recollection was that at the beginning, working with existing projects, it worked quite well. You mentioned that uh, this particular company uh, knew that it could be uh, uh, irresponsible because the government would pick up the check. But in point of fact, it has to go into bankruptcy to have that come about, and most companies do not want to fail in order to have the government pick up the check. The, the object in government, I mean in business, is to be uh, a profitable, well-run business. That is quite true, but it's equally true that executives of corporations have been known to bleed corporations and have their own interests supersede the interests of the corporation. So if in fact individuals in a company bleed the company, they can achieve their objectives even though subsequently the company goes belly up. Isn't and I that couldn't true? agree with you more. I could not agree with you more, but that would require knowledge that there had been some fraud, wrongdoing, intentional wrongdoing, skimming, and the like. And I don't know of any suggestion of that. Indeed, I have such respect for Mr. Barksdale that I believe that if there had been a bill of particulars that included 
that any officials in this company were bleeding the company and in fact uh, misappropriating assets that he would have terminated them indeed criminal proceedings would have been started but, so but all I want to say is that when we looked at this long, when we looked at this it looked like a regulatory problem but you're on the better side of the table because you know what happened I know what happened and it went under well let me let me just sort of establish our respective roles. Both you and I have the benefit of hindsight. Yeah. At the time you were an attorney for DRG, I didn't know the company existed. So you know considerably more than I do. You dealt with them at the time, I didn't know they existed. And now in retrospect, I think our judgment, probably our judgment's peril. Uh, let me just ask you, however, about Mr. Barksdale's letter. Uh, <laughs> You say you have very high regard for Mr. Barksdale, and so do I. This is a brand new program. Mr. Barksdale is charged with the responsibility of running it. And the program is running a year. And one of the two big players in the program puts on his desk something that his executive assistant calls active insanity. Active insanity. So he blows the whistle and he says, you're not going to write any more checks until I, Hart, give you my okay first. That's terrific punishment. When you came to see me last week, you said, DRG came to you and said, hey, we can't do business like this. Is that correct? That is correct. That's exactly what Barksdale wanted. He didn't want them to do business. That's why he plays this extremely onerous restriction on them. He said, you can't make loans until I approve them. DRG doesn't like this. DRG goes to you, asks you to represent them, and you talk. Asked to, of course, just for information of here. Delighted um, to yield to my yeah, friend. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> as I understood your testimony, I have a bad cold or something. My voice is affected. I have the cold, but my voice is affected. Um, as I understood your testimony, your law firm, thanks, your law firm had uh, for some period of time represented DRG, but just on a, on a, on a basis that had to do with matters other than, than this Barksdale letter. Is that correct? That's right. We had occasional representation on uh, a few matters. As I said, it was less than 50 hours a year uh, between 1981 and 1984. And the first really substantial matter that we took on was this uh, uh, coinsurance problem that they faced. Well, now that was, um, that was stimulated or instigated by this letter of November 13, 1984, is that correct? That's correct. In other words, was that your really first acquaintance with these matters that the chairman have been, has been asking you about? In other words, did they come to you then as an attorney with this specific letter and say, we got this letter, we're concerned, this is a serious letter, we need some legal advice? Is that basically what happened? That's exactly what happened. And then, then for a period of time you represented them as lawyers that's and correct. then there came a time when, when you ceased to represent them. That's correct. What, what, is, what, what are the dates involved there, just for my own uh, information? Our law firm represented them uh, through 1986, I believe. There was one matter after uh, uh, a breach of a, uh, or a payment through a con uh, an insurance contract on a loan in 1986 following this matter. I left the firm in 1986 so that uh, I believe that was the last matter that I was familiar with, and, they, and the firm may have continued to do. Some of the matters that the chairman was asking you about had to do with operational decisions or decisions that would have to be made by some person uh, operating the, um, the, um, um, the uh, business. Uh, were you involved in that type of thing too? Oh no, not at all. I think uh, uh, we were regulatory. Uh, we were their lawyers on this problem. They had outside counsel, another law firm, and they had their own lawyers that did their their uh, internal work. 
we were retained to handle this problem dealing with uh, the uh, preclearance, and we dealt with it for roughly seven months. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to try to get that uh, in line there. I, I wasn't quite sure just exactly what their relationship was during this period of time. Thank you. I want to thank my friend for his very helpful intervention. I will just ask a few more questions because I, I know my colleagues are anxious to, to deal with this issue. Is it fair to say, Secretary Hills, that your attempt with Mr. Barksdale and subsequently your attempt with Ms. Wiseman to lift the pre-clearance requirement failed? Uh, yes. Yes, it is true. Uh, is it fair to say that after your attempt with Ms. Barksdale and Ms. Wiseman failed, you then approached Secretary Pierce? Yes, that's true. Could you tell the subcommittee what contact you had with Secretary Pierce with respect to this item by phone or in person? Of course. Or by correspondence? Of course. Uh, First of all, uh, would you permit me to describe Anything how want. the case developed? Um, we urged, as I said to you, uh, DRG to work with HUD, submit loans on a one-by-one -one basis, do the best they could. And they submitted eight loans between the Barksdale letter and February. They withdrew two, and six were approved. Um, so the six new loans Mr. Barksdale approved after he had written this letter. So they, you have the November letter saying these are, these are serious violations. Uh, as I say, each one of the violations has a response, but uh, I'm not here to defend them. I'm just saying that the Bill of Particulars is quite sharp, and yet the company was not terminated, and they tried to work them out. They tried to fix the violations, and six loans were subsequently approved on a loan-by-loan -loan basis. In February, I wrote to Mrs. Weissman because uh, Mr. Barksdale had left, and I asked, I explained the competitive disadvantage that DRG was having because it could not give a commitment on the spot but had to come back to HUD, and because HUD took quite a long while to uh, 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 clear the loans, and although six had gotten through, I wondered if we could develop a procedure that would be more efficient, and could I come in for a meeting? And she was very gracious and thoroughly professional, and she said, of course. So in February, I met with Mrs. Weissman and uh, the other people in the meeting. We brought the client, because the, the client, and um, who was Mr. De, uh, Don DeFranco, the president, and two people, two or three people from DRG, I think one's name was uh, Mr. Latta, who were technical experts, which we were not. I mean, they could battle over these various uh, differences of opinion on underwriting. And from the HUD side, uh, there was uh, uh, Silvio uh, de Bartolomez, I never pronounce his, right, his name right, uh, Gustafson, Conrad Egan, Jimmy Bell, Riley, uh, Hunter Bourne, Hammerneck, Maxim. I mean, the room was filled. There were more than 20 people in the room. It was, a, it was in the uh, conference room at, at HUD. And uh, we discussed, I thought, in a very reasoned way, whether there were options to handle HUD's problems with DRG and DRG's problems with its competitive disadvantage. Because from DRG's point of view, it felt it was getting bled to death. It wasn't getting the, uh, the, the fees in for loans in a timely way since they were going through the process, and they felt their reputation uh, in the community in, was getting um, uh, tarnished because their competitor could say, well, you can't get a loan quickly through DRG. It should have been tarnished, shouldn't it have? Had it well, we remained know tarnished, the American taxpayer could have saved hundreds of millions of dollars. We know that now, and uh, Mrs. Weissman was sympathetic to that, and what she said was it would be uh, better to develop broad guidelines that would affect the industry as a whole. 
so that we would have criteria where there was a soft market that we would have everyone be in pre-clearance mode and maybe we can develop some underwriting criteria so that everyone marches to the same tune. And we left that February meeting with a commitment that DRG's technical people who were there would work very hard with the HUD technical people to try to develop these broad guidelines. And from February to April, we didn't hear anything. Uh, that is to say there was no resolution. The parties apparently were working, but there were no broad guidelines forthcoming. And the process of clearing the loan slowed. Now, I suspect that what happened was that technical people at HUD were so busy developing the broad guidelines that they had to turn their attention from clearing, pre-clearing the loans. In any event, the situation got much worse for DRG. And I didn't hear anything back from Mrs. Wiseman. At the, at the end of April, I wrote to the secretary seeking a meeting and, and, uh, and, and did set up such a meeting. It was uh, in April, as I recall it. And uh, the same parties were there. Uh, I, I was told that Mrs. Weissman testified before you she did not attend the meeting. Uh, I don't know why she didn't. It was known when the meeting was held that she was leaving. She resigned in early May. This meeting was in late April. I just can't give you an explanation of why she wasn't there. But the same long, all of the housing people were there. The same people, I've talked to a couple of people who were at the meeting to verify my recollection. And I remember the meeting as being very crowded, so crowded that the secretary was in his conference room and sharing the head of the conference room table with another person. In other words, two people at the head of the table where you'd normally have one. There were at least 20 people in the room. And that was the way I set up the meeting. I mean, I asked for the meeting, and he caused those people to attend. And we had a very long meeting that was uh, to discuss the merits of whether there was a way to accommodate these, policy, these, these clashes of a company that wasn't being told it had to get out of the business but was feeling like it was getting bled versus the government's interest in having a short tether on a company that had violated the, uh, the regulations. Uh, and that was the meeting. Well, what came out of the meeting is one of the most remarkable developments of Mr. Pierce's eight-year tenure. What came out of the meeting and I wish this would be the forum for me to be able to read the nine-page letter. It's a nine-page letter to the president of DRG Funding, signed by Sam Pierce. You have a copy, I believe, uh, with you, uh, Secretary Hills. I, I don't have a copy with me, but uh, I have we read the letter. We will send one down to you immediately. Which, when you will read it at your leisure, you will share my sort of pained amusement with this letter. This letter is an absolutely devastating letter, recounting all of DRG's flaws, breaches, non-compliance, irregularities, and then concludes, but we will lift the requirement that you pre-clear loans. The, th this letter should be, should be used everywhere when logic is taught to, to teach the concept of non sequitur, something that doesn't follow. Pierce says, you did this, and you did this, and you did this, and you did this. And then you did all these horrible things. And if that were not enough, you did more horrible things. But I'm going to lift the restriction. That's what the nine-page letter says. He says, I'm just giving you snippets of this. You have been advised that the majority of the cases were unacceptable as processed. 
Notwithstanding, you continue to use in violation of regulations and handbook requirements non hot approved personnel to process cases. What we have found is that in addition to the processors not being approved, a request for approval is not even pending. This practice must cease immediately. Financial analysis. None of the cases submitted for pre-commitment review has contained the financial analysis worksheet, nor any evidence that financial statements have been analyzed. Rather, you have submitted a narrative, etc. In summary, you cannot issue firm commitments until and unless a thorough credit investigation, the financial statement analysis have been completed on each principle as required by handbook. Rental analysis. The rental analysis is truly funny. What, what Pierce says is this. When you, DRG, convert a, an apartment unit, a, an apartment house, with many units, from a central meter that measures use of heat and electricity to individual meters, because the central meter the company paid for, the owner paid for, now they wanted to shift the burden to the individual tenants. And they do that, and then they raise their rents. And Pierce says, this is crazy. Under these circumstances, rents are unwarrantedly increased following the renovation period, whereas in actuality, rents may have to be more substantively reduced when utilities are paid by tenants. You follow me on this? I do. It boggles the mind, doesn't it? That you have a, a landlord with 100 units, with a central meter, checking heat and electricity, the landlord pays for it. Now the landlord installs individual meters, so he's relieved of the burden of having to pay for heat and electricity. And he increases the rent. And Pierce says, That's, this is crazy. You should do the exact opposite. And he goes on and on and on. Expense analyses are generally sketchy and poorly documented. And then concludes, <laughs> We are going to lift the restrictions. How do you explain this, Secretary Hills? It's not your letter, but you understand what I'm asking. It is a very sharp, tough letter saying these are the things that we have found in some of your submissions. I think there had been 17 overall since uh, November. I may be off one or two. HUD had cleared seven. And this letter says, in all of our review, uh, we find these as problems, and I'm setting them forth, because he ends up his letter saying that um, after, as you mentioned, he uh, uh, converts the pre-commitment uh, uh, pre review to a post-commitment review, he very, he, he's obviously, bound, he, he's, he's weighing the problem. He says, uh, this will avoid time lag in locating cases. I want you to, uh, uh, well, here, let me read it properly. I'm on the last page, uh, Congressman Horton. Uh, his last three paragraphs, he, it is a tough bill of particulars. It isn't that, that they universally, I don't read the letter saying that they universally had these defects, but these were found in the 17 submissions. And although they, they had cleared seven, he was putting these guidelines down to make no mistake that DRG must comply with these things. And in fact, he's creating a record because he says, However, until further notice, HUD must be advised by DRG whenever a case is closed, and the HUD office that endorsed the case must be indicated. This will avoid any time lag in locating cases that have been closed. We intend to review each case closely in exactly the same manner we have used to review the cases you have submitted thus far. 
we may require additional information on individual cases and expect DRG to respond promptly to those requests. And then he says, if in the process of monitoring, we find significant deviations from these guidelines, from the guidance provided, just these nine pages, or from other regulatory or handbook requirements, we will immediately begin action to withdraw your approval as a co-insured lender and take other appropriate action. Should this become necessary, you'll receive a letter from Assistant Secretary for Housing advising you of your termination and providing information concerning your right to a hearing. So, I said you, you really have to comply. You have a tougher agenda for compliance. You have these nine pages which have picked out violations that they have found in your submissions. You have the guidelines in the handbook. You are going to have to be more careful than careful if you're going to hang on to your insurance. Now, go, you know, in fact, the, the secretary says, uh, we are going to process you loan by loan carefully, as carefully as we have, pro as carefully as Mr. Barksdale contemplated that he was going to review loans uh, before the commitment, and he did approve six, or had approved six. Secretary Pierce says, we are going to as carefully review you afterwards, and if we but, find but any deviation, can. we're but, gonna pull your whole Madam authority. Secretary, you can't, because the difference is the difference between night and day. A pre-commitment review means HUD has to say okay before an Uncle Sam check is signed. A post-commitment review means that Uncle Sam has already signed the check. You are and then to carefully review is a very different exercise. You are of course right, but keep in mind that, as you also pointed out quite correctly at the beginning, that if the company does not have the financial wherewithal and goes out of business, the government gets the whole liability. That's right. Uh, there was no question that DRG was weakened by not being able to be an effective competitor in the market. So there was a balance here between do we bleed the company and slowly have it die while we let out loan by loan, or do we look at the loans and let them get out and really be an effective competitor. Now, by hindsight, there's no question. You and I would agree that probably the remedy in November, based upon the facts that you've given me, some of which I've never heard before, like the Inspector General report, maybe the last letter of, the, uh, of, of, of Pierce's culmination should have been in November, that we are going to have a hearing and determine whether you are a viable co-insured lender at all. But, you know, when you look at the record, everyone is entitled to a hearing who's in business. You don't just uh, uh, postpone a decision until you bleed a company to death. And that was the issue at stake. I, I just have one, of course. Yes, I agree everyone's entitled to a hearing. Before the Secretary of the Department? Do you think everyone's entitled to a hearing before the Secretary of the Department? Uh, I, I mean, there were hearings before ALJs and assistant secretaries and others, but is everybody entitled to a hearing before the secretary of the department? I think it depends on the case. I certainly So the heard answer is no, then. Not every, oh, you're not this entitled. particular case? No. Absolutely. You said, you said everybody's entitled to a hearing as a general principle. Who's going to lose My question is, is everybody entitled to a hearing before the secretary of the department? Uh, Certainly when I was secretary, if a company was going to lose its business or its right to do business, I felt they were entitled to a hearing before the secretary. So I you would saw say any requirement by HUD that would terminate a company's right to do business with HUD, the secretary should personally have to make that decision? Absolutely. I think bog him down or her down? Absolutely. Enormously. And from the secretary, uh, absolutely. Uh, if you are going to take away someone's business, you would go to no. where the ultimate buck stops, Madam and that's Secretary, where the Secretary... we're not Secretary. talking about taking away a business. We're not talking about confiscation. He was not the commissar. We are talking about terminating your right to do business with the government. And to suggest that the Secretary, to assert that the Secretary has to personally decide before the government can ever terminate business with the government, that may be one reason why we don't get enough terminations to get in this trouble. Well, I, I would say to you, you asked my opinion, 
Yes, I think that if a business has grown up and they've hired personnel and put in capital and they're in a business and you're going to take their license away, just as if you were to take my legal license away, I would think that I could... Uh, oh, Madam Secretary, I must say your analogy is very poor. The notion that you suspend someone's license to practice law is the same as saying the federal government will not continue to do business with you I don't think it's legally or practically the case at all, and I don't think any court would hold that it was the same. Well, you're probably right, Mr. Frank, that my analogy is poor, but my conclusion is no different. I do believe that in this case, and I did meet with uh, home builders that had problems. Uh, I do today when there is an appeal from someone on my staff. I did it when I was at the Department of Justice as the head of the Civil Division if there was a disagreement by general counsel with a conclusion, I would appeal. I think that that's what uh, a supervisory layer and if is you required were, if, to if do. If you had such an appeal and you decided contrary to the citizen, you would recommend automatically that it went to the attorney general? I'm because sorry? You talked about when you were in the civil division, but you were not the head of the department. If you were in the civil division and you had a comparable dispute and you decided against the private party, you believe that they would always have a right to go to the attorney general? They often did. Did they, in your judgment, that, that was the right they always had? They always have that right, whether they, it is permitted, whether the Attorney General has the time to see them, but very often... But you often, think the Attorney General ought always to see people in that situation when they were appealing your decision? Depends on the case. It oh, also depends on that. whether the Attorney General reads the uh, conclusion and says, I agree, or whether he reads it and says, there is, uh, I'm not sure I understand all the issues, or I would like an airing of this. I think it depends on the case, but I, I would say that if you are going to head a corporation, head a department or of agency, you better be prepared to take the review process. That I mean, you better s to oversee your organization, and that will require you to review these sorts I'll of cases. Congressman Lupins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As usual, Mr. Chairman, I'd be delighted to yield to my ranking Question member. Question. Uh, uh, after this letter came in, you were the attorney for them, and you represented them during this period. Was this basically the end of, the, um, of your work for them in, in connection with this uh, project? In other words, was this, uh, as an attorney, if, uh, I would assume that this letter, if I were in, in your shoes, I would have uh, said to the client, well, this terminates our work, and then this is the end of it, and close the case, so to speak. That is uh, basically it. They complain bitterly still because they felt they were on such a short tether that there was not so much difference between the pre-commitment and the post-commitment audit review. And since it was still, it was articulated as being on a loan by loan basis, they thought that they were still uh, not as uh, free as they ought to be. But this was the end from the law firm. We had gotten our decision from the secretary. Did you during the course of that period of time um, other than what you've already said, have any personal conversations or telephone calls to the secretary with regard to this particular case? No. None that I recall. I think it, Mr. Horton, it was really over uh, after the secretary ruled and they went forth. Uh, I have talked to partners in my former law firm to uh, ask whether there is anything. Unfortunately, the files are in storage, but there is nothing that would refresh either of our re uh, recollections that there was anything that followed this substantially. Roughly how many hours did you and your partners put into this uh, effort? Just a ballpark figure. Five hours? Oh, no. Oh, how many? Roughly. Uh, more like 500. And then you charged on an hourly basis for the, for the work that you did. No, I'm wrong. I have... Uh, uh, more like uh, 150, I would guess, or uh, it's a guess, but, but, but more than 100, less than 500. In. You Pardon and your me. law firm uh, and, and other partners that worked on this put substantial time in. That's right. Representing them, and then there came a time when you sent them a bill, and it was based on the um, time that you and your partners had, right. had expended. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank, thank you. Madam Ambassador, as usual, our chairman has waded into the swamp and drained a little bit. I'm going to try and just follow the path of it, if I might. Let me ask you to set aside your immediate experience uh, as the DRG legal representative 
and draw upon your vast experience as former secretary, for which we all have great admir admiration for the job you did. And I ask you a couple of functional questions. I'm personally very, very involved in trying to decide whether it's simply poor personnel selection combined with a bad structure or a, a, a system full of weaknesses uh, that led to this huge uh, rape of the public treasury through the HUD grants. So looking at that, one of the problems I see is that DRG was such a major player in coinsurance. Would you agree with that? Yes, it was. Um, they defaulted on a billion four of the total program. They were responsible for $500 million in default. So basically 35% of, of uh, the, the total loss was virtually all on DRG's hands. Looking at those figures and extrapolating, they were there for 70% of the total coinsurance program of HUD. Wasn't that in, in itself a major mistake to put one company so out, uh, in such almost a monopolistic position that they became, if they failed as they did, they dragged the whole program down? They were the largest uh, lender in the old days under the 223F multifamily program when the government uh, uh, was doing 100% of the insurance. They, had, they, they were a leader in the mortgage uh, lending business. And so when they converted to coinsurance, it was not surprising that they were also a leader in the coinsurance field. But you're right, they, uh, uh, they were the largest single lender, and it did take some capital uh, to get into this business, 2% of the loans, and as the loans grew, you uh, had to continue to build up the, uh, the capital requirement. But uh, uh, they were a leader in terms of size. Let me share with you, Madam Ambassador and the members of the committee, my personal experience from uh, our so-called um, banking crisis, the SNL crisis in Ohio, when I chaired the banking committee, the major problem we had with the self-insurance group, which was that time called Ohio Development uh, uh, Grant Insurance, those people allowed one company, Home State, to become 20% uh, of their, of their insurance funds. And when home state fell, it dragged down the whole system. They, in fact, in Ohio, the Ohio Deposit Guarantee Fund, ODGF, was three and a half times better funded than the SNL. My point is here, the same weakness seems to have crept into the system that when you have a, one single entity allowed to become such a major player in any insurance or any guaranteed loan practice, you're just flirting with disaster. If that major player goes, the whole yes. system goes. Would you agree with that? Oh, yes. Obviously, if a, if a large player in a market goes bankrupt, uh, that's uh, Then do you have game. any suggestions as to what could be done to correct that part, that small part of this overall system? Would you advise a percent uh, participation limit on any of these individual coinsurance or mortgage lenders in the future? That no one would have, no entity would have more than, say, 10% of the total portfolio or 20%? Would, would you advise that if you were back there? I think that um, I probably would start with some management concepts. Uh, I think it's very, very important to uh, have uh, uh, close scrutiny of the Inspector General's report and keep a good audit process going and uh, have a hands-on management so that you can uh, uh, re review cases quickly when problems are developed, uh, not to postpone the decision and uh, where there is a problem to uh, work with it. Now you can arbitrarily say uh, the top lending in a co-insurance program would be 20%, say, and you do um, limit the liability if that company goes into bankruptcy, but the purpose of the, uh, the co-insurance program was to help the government that didn't have the personnel to uh, uh, have insurance on these programs. And frankly, they worked better when they worked only with existing projects because you could see the neighborhood, you could see what the rent up figures were, and you weren't projecting ahead two years to say, or one year, what will be the rental. But uh, I think you could, uh, notwithstanding, uh, have a good co-insurance program if you could monitor it closely and have a very talented SWAT team that would go in and audit these, you know, it's much easier to do the underwriting in your desk. 
where you're looking at this report and when you find a problem to move quickly. Uh, but uh, that would be my remedy is to have very, very talented people who are doing an audit process and then moving quickly to either you're in or you're out. But you do have to have the hearing. I know it's a briefly perusing your comments, your opening statement, that you, you believe in hands-on management, which you're repeating here. And the immediate availabil availability of the IG reports, or at yes. least uh, 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 heavy reliance on those reports. And, and to thoroughly... personally read them. The person at the top has to read the IG report, have an open door to the IG, and have an accessible, aggressive IG who will come in, you know, Tuesday at 3 o'clock if there's a problem, and bring it to your attention. Because if you regard that as not your top priority, it's the same thing that happens in a corporate enterprise. Uh, the way you get good management in any corporate enterprise is when the CEO sets the environment that this is very important and works at it. And of course, I don't think the CEO can do this without a good IG and good access. Well, you'd be interested, I think the, the chair would be interested in uh, a in very pain but uh, somewhat amused um, corollary with the Ohio situation was that in that instance, both a Republican governor and a Democrat governor after the, uh, this particular SNL had reached what they call Category 4, which is emergency red light alert, each administration allowed that particular firm to expand 10 more banks into Ohio before the eventual failure. And what's interesting is, when that was done, they were supposed to read these reports and be aware of them, but because of a lack of a requirement that anyone sign off or even initial, there was no indication of these clean reports that anybody had read anything. And as a result, everyone gets off scot-free. Because, administratively speaking. Now, to the point, how would you guarantee a reaction? This was your third point in testimony, immediate over, or strong oversight, immediate reaction to this. How would you build that into the system so that you would have, first of all, the requirement they read the report, and secondly, an immediate reaction to correct these mistakes? And these went on for four or five years, as the chairman pointed out. I mean, how would you build that into the system? Well, I would try to select people who uh, uh, were talented, who could bring it to my attention. I would set in a management system so that uh, this being a sensitive area and wherever you deal with large sums of money, it is sensitive, where you would have some objectives. You would know you would have a report in on a periodic basis as to what was happening in this area in the co-insurance program, regular meetings with the inspector general, you know, in the mid-70s, we had a similar problem with single-family dwellings and uh, the mortgage bankers. And we set up a system of uh, uh, a real management system to deal with the problem, uh, which required a mortgage review board uh, that uh, looked at audit reports. That meant that you had an action-forcing event. If you required an audit, of each of your mortgagees and you had your inspector general meeting on a designated day, everyone would read those materials and would be informed. That's a tremendous protection. And also we worked with the mortgage bankers at that time for a self-governance procedure uh, so that they too worked within their own organization to try to initiate reforms. I think it worked pretty well. Well, I think if we had someone like you involved in every instance, it would work. What I'm looking at is a system that because of the failure of personnel integrity, apparently just fell apart or functioned only for very few. In that instance, I'm looking personally for some way to devise a uh, more, a greatly improved system, almost fail-safe, that regardless of when you get someone in there who may be weak in terms of uh, integrity, that the system functions right over that person, in spite of that person's reluctance to, uh, uh, or that person's willingness to change rules. I, I'm looking for some way out of this uh, morass from the standpoint, not of weak personnel policy and weak personnel choice, the standpoint of the structural weaknesses. Let me ask you to end up just asking the question that bothers me a little bit about the whole thing. We've laid out, the chairman's done a great job in that, laying out the time sequence involved. You obviously predicated your entry as legal counsel to DRG with full knowledge and awareness of the letter from Barksdale, the now famous Absolutely. Barksdale letter. And as has been pointed out in the committee, that was a very scathing indictment of almost every aspect of underwriting. 
in which DRG was supposed to, was the leading co-insurer of the federal program at HUD. Were you not truly concerned about taking on the case knowing that they had, on the surface, committed errors that are now looking to be criminal, uh, but at least at that time were very, very incriminating? I mean, was that not a great concern to you that they had seemed to be so casual in approaching their responsibilities in so many areas, rather than just a few? It wasn't like a you know, mistake here and there. It was almost a methodical uh, abuse of the system. Did that not really concern you greatly? I can tell you sincerely, it did not come across in November or February of a methodical abuse of the system. Keep in mind that HUD approved six more loans after that so-called scathing letter came across. And when we asked and tried to do our research on the regulations, we were able to uh, try to respond to or ask for an explanation of some of these allegations. For example, uh, a, risk, a, a repair escrow was used in a refinancing uh, transaction. I believe you, Mr. Chairman, referred to that. The response when, I, when we asked, what was that all about? Well, a $29,000 of exterior repairs funded by the escrow was less than four-tenths of one percent of the loan and has, since the letter, been completed. So that eliminates that. There were six grievances in Mr. Barksdale's letter. And he may have the information to say it was an act of insanity uh, to make the loan, but we, didn't, we weren't engaged to make the loan. We came in after they had a problem with the loan and were reciting uh, grievances with three projects. And we were saying to the client, fix these grievances we will see if you're in compliance with the handbook and the regulations, but you've got to fix these, just as we said when we got the Pierce letter where he had the nine pages of things you must do and said these nine pages will continue to be overlaid on the handbook and the regulatory guidelines. You must now comply with my nine-page letter, the handbook, and the regulations. So we said, well, how serious are these things? For example, on uh, your comment, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Lukens, on the property value, the appraisal process, you know, appraisals are subjective and to some extent. And so what, what you, you have an, a, a, quite a, a sharp statement by Mr. Barksdale about the uh, property values and projected rents exceeded those arrived at by the HUD appraiser. Response, the underwriting appraisal was conducted by an MAI appraiser approved by the HUD central office who, st who stands, insists that he stands by his appraisal. Indeed, HUD used the same company to analyze some of these projects that the client used the president of to do the appraisal for its debate with HUD over who was right and who was wrong. Now, I, who's so to say? At the time, in November, we know, knew that there was a quarrel, and it was true. So they had violated the regulation, and whether it's $29,000 or not, you're not supposed to put it in the repair escrow, and we told them that. We researched the regulations, that HUD's right on this, you've got to fix it. So in your professional opinion, there were no items that were not correctable, and there were no items that were intentionally uh, committed uh, by DRG as your client at yeah, that time? In, in my opinion, we did not have information that would lead us to believe that there was any item that was not correctable, but we weren't in that side of the case. And our client was negotiating with HUD, and HUD seemed to say that this wasn't such an egregious actor that it had to be drummed out of the program. As I say, other loans were being approved, and there was a remedy. I have to tell you so, so directly that in all of this representation, I never had a hint of fraud or intentional wrongdoing from HUD. No one ever said to me, Carla, uh, this client, you really, uh, something's wrong with it. Never. It was always a very professional meeting with 20 people in the room, understanding that the client was uh, competitively at a disadvantage because, as you say, it was one of the leaders and there were, I think, two companies that made up the major portion, so as com competing against the other leader, they were at a tremendous competitive disadvantage and they couldn't give a commitment on the spot. 
versus HUD's desire to, in this new program to have it get off to a good start. And what we were trying to do is to do everything. That is to have our client solve its problems, whether they appear in the Barksdale letter or in the Pierce letter, and let them get on with their business because they hadn't been drummed out of the program. No one ever said, they are so bad we should have a hearing and throw them out of the program. It was always to try to fix them so they could continue to do business. Well, to summarize, with your belief that strong hands-on management, a good IG system, yes. and an aggressive oversight follow-through, do you think, given the uh, dream that we can have more private enterprise involved and, uh, if you will, privatize many areas, do you believe that co-insurance in the area should be looked at from the standpoint of turning it all over to private enterprise if those things function well, or should we go the other way and return to full government uh, insurance? Uh, just a general overview on your concept of what should be done with the co-insurance program. I think you've got to make a policy choice. If you go 100% insurance with the federal government doing all the underwriting, you're going to need a lot more people. You really are going to need a lot more people in number, talent and capacity. If you go the co-insurance route, you're still going to need some very good people. Now one of the differences that I notice between HUD today and HUD when I was there 15 years ago is that there has been an enormous loss of great professionals. People like George Hips, Sandy Wachowski, Warren Lasko are gone, Jimmy, uh, J uh, John Bell. These were professionals below the policy appointments and were very, very good. Look at this case. Mr. Barksdale was good and professional. He was there and three months after they got into the case, Mrs. Weissman was there. She was there five months and she was gone and someone else was there. So that uh, you have a lot of turnover at the policy level at the same time that you had a lot of retirement and loss of some very good people. And frankly, this, this uh, if, if I were secretary, I would try so hard to select people who had had experience in exercising authority. Thank you, Madam Ambassador. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Frank. I very much appreciate your ending on that note with Mr. Lukens, and I'd like to start off with it because one of the sad facts, and I think it was particularly a problem in the last eight years, was the number of very good people who left. And I think that it shows that you cannot underpay and at the same time abuse career civil servants and then be surprised when you don't have good ones. Uh, we did lose, and Mr. Egan, who was mentioned, is another one who was a career civil servant I that I very much enjoyed working with, and I know you would agree. I definitely do agree. And uh, the, the anti-public employee rhetoric and attitude uh, of recent times you're right, Madam Ambassador, it's one of the prices we're paying, and it's why I welcome President Bush's proposal that we pay our public employees, more particularly those who are uh, uh, below the presidential level, where, you know, those of us elected and those of us at the presidential level, we have a case, but it's a different case. Uh, Glad that we're all back now on a uh, on a uh, a good plane. Thank you. The questions I have with regard to uh, DRG now. Um, at what point did you begin your representation? 1981. Of DRG. Yes. And what did you do? Occasionally. What kinds of things did you do before this one arose? The only thing I can precisely remember, and uh, one of my meetings with was with George Hips and Warren Lasko. Uh, was uh, on uh, whether there was a way for HUD not to have rent control of localities apply to HUD-assisted projects. 
uh, that was a damaging effect, and DR, that was a, a DRG was interested in that. Co-insured or otherwise assisted? No, this was way before uh, co-insurance. Oh, okay, because yeah. I had a, I, my understanding is the policy now is that where the HUD has assisted that does preempt rent control, there was an effort by some of the recipients of co-insurance to preempt rent control. That one didn't seem to me to work very well. Um, but with regard to this particular problem, you started, uh, you, you did not represent DRG in any other matter other than trying to get rent control not applied to some of their assisted projects? I can't make that representation. I know that for 50 hours a year, we didn't do very much. I know we were not their outside counsel. That's your firm you're talking about. The 50 hours yes. is not just yourself, but the firm. The total firm. The total firm. And so when uh, did you first get engaged by them? Did you, were you on a retainer or did you have to be separately engaged to do this one? Well, when the client calls, uh, we open a new matter memorandum dealing with that matter. Okay. And uh, uh, the... But you, you had a relationship that was at a somewhat low level of activity with DRG. That's correct. And it increased uh, at what, what uh, date? With the Maurice Barksdale letter, they brought it in and what said... What date was that? Um, that was the one the chairman read? It was November. November. November, November of 84. Now, and you terminated this phase of your relationship with them when? Uh, after the letter from, uh, uh, yeah, there was a um, this is kind of an epistle a letter novel, that the DRG wrote to Secretary Pierce in summer of '85, okay. complaining against about I think the continued supervision. Uh, I don't know whether our firm was shown that letter or not. Okay. I have no recollection, right, but I can tell letter, you this is the letter they wrote subsequent to the Pierce letter, and they yes. complained complained about and the your firm didn't prepare that letter or help in the preparation of it I, I, I infer from what you're saying I have no recollection that we did you didn't no I have no recollection that we did I mean right. I, might it be it that would you did without remembering it? I don't mean to be rude sometimes you do but would you have possibly I mean you've obviously refreshed your recollection with regard to this if you can remember the 29,000 I thought maybe you could remember do you have any recollection that you helped write a letter uh, at that point? I have no recollection that I helped write that letter. The reason I re recall the 29,000 is I got the fact sheet on the pros and cons on the yeah. initial uh, Right, but I thought complaint. you might have that letter in your file, too. And, I don't uh, no, I have not seen the full file. Uh, I have seen a few scattered letters. You didn't review the file in preparation for your testimony? I reviewed. The best thing I could find on, uh, on meetings and so forth was uh, the billing file uh, where yeah, we had rendered a diary a billing yeah. so it would say yeah. on on uh, uh, so there was May, no billing something for such a we met with and sometimes there was a listing of people and if there were a listing of people I was able to call them and say do you right. remember yeah. who was there and somebody for example at the right. Shirley Weissman well, meeting had the, a list listen, on the letter the final now, now this is a letter I hadn't heard about this before maybe I was out of the room for a bit this was after Mr. Pierce's letter. DRG wrote back to complain what? That they said too much monitoring. Was they still being subjected to a pre to a pre clearance process? Was that what they complained about? Have we got that letter? I'd like to get that letter if we could. When because so you left it that Pierce wrote them a stiff letter. Right. I mean Pierce was at the meeting. Right. Um, I can explain by the way why Mr. Pierce had to share the head of the table. They weren't used to his being there. They must have set a place for someone else, and when he showed up, they had to give him a chair. The um, on the question of, you, you left it with us that uh, you told DRG, now you got this letter and you do what they're told. Right. And that letter came in May, I believe, from Mr. Pierce? That's correct. And a month or two later, DRG is writing back and complaining? I believe I've that seen such a letter. Like I don't have of, it, but I believe I've seen such a letter. That doesn't sound like your lecture took. Um, what were they complaining of? My, rec they? my recollection was it was complaining about the continued supervision. Well, but Mr. Pierce said supervision. You said pay attention to supervision. Were they complaining about Mr. Pierce's conditions or were they, I mean, were they still being subjected to pre-commitment? Pre-commitment, no. I, well, okay, so that, but I don't believe problem. so. I was not good? running their business. No, no one said you were running their business. You're the lawyer. Were you still the lawyer at the time? I thought you were still the lawyer at that time, uh, for that matter. The point is this, you represented to Mr. Horton that when you got Pierce's letter, you said to them, you pay attention to this. And now we're told that within a month or two after that letter, they're writing and complaining about it. That's that right. That does not sound to me like very compliant people or people who had the right attitude. Well, were they complaining in that letter? I mean, you brought the letter up. Were they complaining about doing what you had told them they had to do? I, I don't have the letter in front of me, and I can only say that my recollection was that they were complaining about supervision. But the clients don't always do what I tell them. Well, I understand that. But uh, if you were representing them, I, this is what bothers me, and I, I appreciate that. Uh, let me ask, do you have any 
And this has to do with lobbying, lawyering. Um, you weren't just anyway, you were former Secretary of Department. Did you feel any obligation having told them to do this, to check? Did you participate in setting up any monitoring? I mean, we have this unusual situation where the staff fairly overwhelmingly seemed to feel that these people were doing wrong things. The two assistant secretaries, I believe they were both functioning at the level of assistant secretary, Mr. Barksdale and Ms. Wiseman, concurred with the staff. The secretary overrules them after a meeting which he grants at the request of a former secretary of HUD with some time elapsing. And they are told by the secretary, okay, but you've got to live up to all these things. And now we're told within a couple of months they're complaining about that. And uh, in other words, they, you get the secretary to overrule virtually everybody under him in the department, both at the political level and at the career level, on the basis of a letter, and it takes your client about two months to start kicking over those traces. Did you work with the client in the interim period? Did you have any, did you help them monitor it? Did you have any sense of involvement in whether or not they complied with Mr. Pierce's letter? No, I would not be uh, equipped to set up a, a monitoring, uh, and I wasn't hired to do that. So your responsibility was to get Pierce to overturn the decision, and once he did that, you were out of it. I would say you had no further involvement, responsibility, obligations, or anything. You were you were hired, and then, there were, then it was up to other lawyers, presumably, to do that. They had general counsel, yeah. general see, outside that's, counsel. That's part of the problem uh, that that gets us into this. Apparently, you were hired for this particular matter, not having had any great prior involvement with DRG and none on coinsurance, solely for the purpose of getting the department to overturn the Parksdale letter. And that's bothersome, fully within the ethical responsibility of the lawyers as it now is. And I will tell you that it bothers me in particular in my capacity as the subcommittee of the, the subcommittee chairman of administrative law where we have post-employment lobbying. We've generally said a year. I tell you, you see, you wrote to Mr. Pierce, you called Mr. Pierce, you said in April. Yes? Uh, I don't think that's quite a fair assumption of what she said. Of conclusion from what she said. Well, what do you disagree with? Well, uh, you, you indicated that, um, that uh, her job was to get the secretary to over, overturn to get the department the, to overturn the Barksdale letter, but, the secretary. but she's testified differently. She said that when they got the letter, she advised them. Yes, Mr. Horton, she did. And then she yeah, also no, said, wait, wait, no, it's finish. my time, Mr. Horton, and you well, can I understand. take it. And I'm going to respond to you on my time. You can take the time when you want. But I just but, wanted to explain. No, Mr. Horton, this is my time. The point is this, and I think that I listened to you give her that opportunity to say that, and it then turns out that subsequent to the ambassador having told them to follow what Mr. Pierce said, they wrote a letter, which we don't have a copy of, complaining about, it sounds like, what Mr. Pierce said, and the ambassador's testimony is that she had no obligation, responsibility, authority in any other way to make them enforce it. So in fact, what I'm saying is that her instruction to them, her exhortation, and she couldn't instruct them, uh, to follow was well-intentioned but had no effect apparently, and that's part but of what we talked about. Further. That I wasn't yield. what I was talking about, and that wasn't what I was referring to. Well, Mr. Horton, I'll tell you this. No, I'm going to, when I finish well, questioning for a while, I will yield you for a while. I understand your desire to defend the witness. I think she's well able to defend herself. Well, I don't I'm think you, I don't think that she needs this kind of constant invention, I will be glad to yield after a while, but I want to talk to her some. You've made your points before. I want to pursue this with the witness. I will be glad to discuss it with you subsequently. But at this point, I'm going to continue to question the witness. And I think this is part of the problem. We have, and I want to ask you, you called Mr. Pierce when? You said end of, uh, sort of, end, the of, end April. of April. What time period intervened between your phone call to Mr. Pierce and the meeting with Mr. Pierce? Uh, I believe about, uh a week or so. Okay. Do you think that if you had not been a former secretary of the department and a major figure, in other words, if this was purely a strictly legal representation, do you think the secretary would, within a week or so, have granted uh, such a meeting? I will tell you that it's totally contrary to Mr. Pierce's style. It may have been consistent with what you would have done, but I, I wonder whether you think that's consistent with what Mr. Pierce generally would have done. I can only talk about myself. Uh, when okay. I was at uh, HUD, I regularly met with people that uh, wished to discuss a problem with which they disagreed. Right. You made a couple of representation, if you would permit me. Uh, I am not of the view that everyone in the department uh, was 
absolutely against trying to work out the competitive impediment to the, one of the largest co-insurers and some sort of a methodology that would ensure protection and compliance with the regulations. It was less of an overturning than a converting oh, no, into no, a no. system that would run no. better. No, they overturned, please, let's be very clear. Well, they overturned the requirement of pre-commitment. It was an overturning because the key in this was the requirement of pre-commitment, which as the chairman correctly pointed out was a night and day difference. Post-commitment review is not in the same league with pre-commitment review. Post-commitment review means we're already stuck with the money. And as a matter of fact, the way it worked in this case, post-commitment review helped them get big enough to where they were apparently then arguing with regard to Colonial House that they were too big to fail because they were then having gotten enough commitments and when the Colonial House issue arose, apparently it sounded like they were arguing that, well, step on me now, pal, and you're really in the soup. So uh, who believed that the pre-commitment position, you said there were people in HUD who agreed with you that pre-commitment was too harsh. No, I, I said I don't believe that everyone in the department. Well, who agreed it with isn't you? a question of harshness. You see, it's a policy issue. All right, who, who disagreed with you? No, who, who let me just explain you to you. No, let me ask you a question. I'll adopt your terminology. I can't. Who agreed give... with you that the policy of requiring pre commitment should be overturned, other than Secretary Pierce? I can only say at the meetings there was a tremendous effort to search for a method that would be more uniform within the industry. Pre-commitment review has a very big downside for the government. I said, no, Madam Ambassador, please, let's be clear what I'm asking you. We're not debating now whether they should or shouldn't have pre-commitment. We're debating your taking exception to my statement that it looked like virtually everybody, I hope they said virtually everybody, in the department below the secretary who dealt with this, two assistant secretaries and their career staff, thought pre-commitment was necessary. And you said no, there were other people besides your secretary who disagreed. Um, I, I believe I said, I, be, I, I, I believe I didn't say there were other people. Oh, okay. Well, then, then I misunderstood but, you and I apologize. But please, so I, think, I think you I mean, will... The point would be this. It took a meeting with the secretary. You couldn't get that overturned. I mean, you started in November, between November and April. You weren't able to get pre-commitment dumped until you got the meeting with Pierce, correct? Oh, that's correct. Okay. Now, let me ask you about DRG's financial problem, because this bothers me. You said, one, it was a competitive disadvantage, although they did get six commitments accepted. Um, and two more, you said, that would have been accepted that they were turned down because... No, they withdrew them. DRG dropped them. They weren't rejected by HUD. Is that correct? On the first, you said six of the eight, two were withdrawn Two by were D withdrawn by without DRG. being... Well, that's in a short period of time. I don't know what their expectations were. Um, my problem though is this. You said to me that they had a good case for meeting with peers because their livelihood was at stake. Is that an accurate statement of what you said to me, that we were basically putting them out of business if we stopped doing business with them? Is that well, it was a very major program, I think, as Mr. Lukens pointed out. They were a leader in the current no, no. insurance and, and program. I'm a very literal-minded person. I'm, they, they could be very big and they could be a leader. That's not what I thought you said. Uh, if, if I misheard you, I will apologize. I thought you were saying that HUD's refusal to continue to do business with them was the equivalent of putting them out of business. Did I hear you say that? That would put them out of the co-insurance business. Oh, but business. just co-insurance. They would stay in business elsewhere. But they this would not have put them totally out of business. I, th I thought you were representing that this would have put them totally out of business. This was a very big... I cannot t today tell okay. you what percentage of their business was co-insurance, but it was a very large percentage by my recollection. Now, you said that uh, in December with Colonial House, you did not... In December of 85, your representation went from November of 84, basically, to about June or July of 85 on this matter. Is that accurate? In this matter. Well, it may have gone, as I say, there was a letter that you okay, don't have do that. in... We're uh, going to get that letter in... Uh, uh, in uh, August. Okay. Uh, so, in December of 85, you say you did not know DRG's financial condition. Is that correct? I, I couldn't hear what you said. You said that in December of 85, you did not know DRG's financial condition. That's right. Yeah. Um, did you know it in April of 85? DRG's financial condition? I don't have a recollection that I did. Why, why would I have a, a... Because you went to HUD and said, don't pre-commit on these people post-commit. And you just said to the chairman, the chairman said, well, yeah, well, then the federal government's at risk. And you said, no, because these people have a, an aversion to going into bankruptcy. I must say, one of the things we probably ought to do is to do profiles of people and see to what extent they are bankruptcy averse. Some people seem to be more bankruptcy averse than others. But um, it seems to me for you not to have known something about their financial condition 
would have been a problem making the representations you made. For you to have gone in and asked that the secretary overturn a pre-commitment requirement made by two assistant secretaries, one after the other, and virtually all of the professional staff who dealt with it, to do that not knowing their financial situation was a serious problem. Well, Mr. Frank, I knew that uh, they met the criteria of HUD. It wasn't HUD complaining that their financial uh, situation was uh, incorrectly represented. It was regulatory problems that they had with the coinsurance program. But in fact, there were some financial problems when they got back into the, when they got the right to do commitments because the result of their getting the right which you got for them was that they overcommitted, went bankrupt, and we got stuck. And it does seem to me that it was legitimate to know what their financial commitment was. And the reason I say that is this. You argued that their own financial state was one of the safeguards, and I agree with that. Theoretically built into the coinsurance system is that the coinsurer has a financial stake in the soundness of the commitments to avoid bankruptcy. It sounds in this case, and, and, and it did seem to me before you were suggesting that stopping them from coinsuring was almost like putting them out of business, um, that wouldn't have been the case if they'd been adequately capitalized. It sounded to me like they were inadequately capitalized, that they got kind of panicky because they were aware of that, and that their ability to avoid bankruptcy depended on their ability to keep piling up commitments. And that, even with that, of course, we got into trouble. We got into trouble at a somewhat uh, bigger level. Let me ask you about Colonial House, uh, which was 85. So that, the December 85, that's after your representation? I'm sorry, this? I did not. Uh, well, did you have any discussions uh, with anybody at HUD about Colonial House? Did you talk to anybody or lobby on Colonial House specifically? The Colonial House was one of the projects named in Mr. Barksdale's letter. Did you talk specifically with anybody about Colonial House, to your I, recollection? No, I don't recall that I did, other than as it was in the reg that they had to, they had violated uh, four practices uh, named in the Barksdale letter that were attributed to Colonial House. So you might have talked about that at the, uh, w w w to Mr. Barksdale, was that the, well, no, Mr. Barksdale. Well, well in each instance, the question was, had they fixed the four problems that had been enumerated, with respect to Colonial House, there was one problem with the Georgetown Apartments and one problem with Palm Lake Apartments. Uh, this was rather like an overlay to the handbook and regulations, just like the Pierce letter, which had problems that it saw, that he saw. Did you talk to the secretary specifically about Colonial House, or? I don't recall talking about the Colonial what House you have project per se to anyone. Did you have meetings with the secretary other than the phone call asking for the meeting and that uh, meeting in his office? Was there further contact between you and Secretary Pierce? I believe I wrote to him when I didn't get a, a response after our meeting so that there was a letter seeking the meeting and a meeting and then another letter. And the meeting was when now, the middle of April? Uh, I think it was at the end of April. The end of April and his letter? Is in mid-May, I think. May 10th, that, you had a... I must say, Madam Ambassador, you seem to be in the rare category of people who may have been a little unfair to Mr. Pierce. I mean, you met with him at the end of April. The letter to Mr. DeFranco was dated May 10th as the receipt, and you called him in between that? No, I wrote to him. So in must between, admit, uh, in, in must, one it, week, you thought he hadn't moved quickly enough to re overturn yeah. the pre-commitment thing? I, that, we frankly, regarded this. It makes it hard to think that it was really based on an exhaustive study of the merits. I mean, you see him at the end of April, you say, and what, two or three days later you're writing to him, or four or five days later you're writing to him to urge him to move quickly. I, that seems to me unfair to Mr. Pierce. You wrote to him within a few days? I, I, my recollection, I don't have the dates. You have the letters, I don't letter? have the letters. Do we have a copy of that letter? Uh, Could we get a copy of that letter, uh, Madam Ambassador, the letter you sent to Mr. Pierce? Of course. A, a few days afterwards? Thank you. I just want to, uh... Now, in 1986, you mentioned, this is my last question, you mentioned in 1986, well, I have two further questions. In 1986, you did one more matter for DRG, you said? That's right. Could you describe that matter? Yes, uh, there was a loan made uh, in the Title X program. We did not make the loan. That we, loan being, we being you, the law firm, or you, DRG? We, the law firm, had nothing to do with it. The loan was made... By DRG? By DRG. It was... Um, sold to a group of investors headed up by Solomon Brothers, and then the loan went into default. The government paid 
the investors the insurance proceeds but refused to pay, as I recall it, the interest and the fees as not covered by the contract. And we were retained to argue, to look at the contract. It was a very- Retained by whom? By DRG. Because the because government's it, position would have left DRG liable for that, uh, for those fees? That's right. If the, invest, the investors felt that they were to be fully covered and that they felt that there would be a suit. And uh, uh, we met with the general counsel uh, at some length, a partner in my law firm and I. Uh, it was a very technical issue. We did discuss the uh, issue with Secretary Pierce, as I recall. He disagreed with us. And uh, we did, did not get HUD to pay the, uh, the, the amounts that we were alleging that would be appropriate for them to pay. As I recall then, we got out of it. It went back to their general counsel, uh, the DRG. DRG's general counsel. Do you know if he sued HUD? And I believe that there was litigation. I just, okay. because you, we weren't into it. You tried and got but, Let me uh, ask you back before. You said that uh, DRG had a right to a hearing because of the termination. But that's a hearing you meant in the ALJ process? Yes. Not with the secretary, I mean, in a legal sense. What would have been the option if the secretary had refused to reverse the pre-commitment situation? You would have had a right to an administrative law judge, is that correct? If they had been terminated, if they were just on a pre-commitment review, I haven't analyzed this. Okay. Well, not correct, I think right. that uh, if they're terminated out of the program where they have acted, it's a, uh, certainly they would be entitled to notice, I would think, and uh, uh, the opportunity to respond right. I in, think an, in an a fair forum. Pardon? I wouldn't think an ALJ. Again, we want to be very careful. and I. I I mean, I, I know that one's views of due process sometimes shift. Uh, I was struck reading the Nofziger opinion at the uh, civil libertarian zeal of the judges who wrote that opinion. I, it seems to be clear today we have a new branch of civil libertarians in Washington. They are conservatives whose friends have been arrested. And so people become much more uh, passionate about this. Um, but I wouldn't want to argue that having been doing business with the government you have somehow acquired a vested right to continue to do that business and that a decision by the administration at whatever level to stop doing business with you is something that would require a formal hearing before an administrative law judge. And neither of us is saying that, I hope, in, as a general principle. Uh, Mr. Frank, let's supposing that uh, the government very much wants to get into the co-insurance business and entices Company A to... Entices? Well, yes, to get How into How do they it. entice them? by saying that uh, you will get fees for doing our, un our underwriting work. It was very difficult for the federal government to do 100% insurance because they did not have the people necessary to do the appropriate underwriting. So they, they were, the, the they, a decision the was made, yeah. uh, you can quarrel with the decision, but it was a policy decision to use the private right. market to do the underwriting and that they would have enough people and capacity to do a checkup on the private underwriting. If a company gets into that business and hires people and gets into it and makes loans and then you say, sorry, I've changed my mind, it seems to me that there is a substantial... Uh, uh, well, if we said, sorry, we've changed our mind, we don't want to do it this way anymore, you're not arguing the company would have any right whatsoever, would you? Well, I, I guess if I, uh, I would say if a client uh, uh, retained me, that they would be entitled if their uh, business... Is something specifically written into the contract for termination fees? I beg your pardon? I, we're talking now absent something specifically written into a contract which provides termination fees. You're saying as a general principle, if the government decides to contract with private individuals and then Congress votes to do it differently, uh, new administration comes in, people change their minds, Somehow those who had done business have acquired a vested right. I think that's a very dangerous topic. I don't think we have a congressional law change here, but I know that when I was at, uh, at uh, HUD, we had a problem with the demolition contractors, and we felt some were breaching their fiduciary duty and really, frankly, uh, breaching some very serious regulations. In terminating those uh, uh, contractors, I gave them notice that they would have a right of hearing, and we set up Before whom? Uh, an, uh, an administrative law okay. judge. But not before. Did you personally uh, terminate any of them? Oh, yes. 
I mean, personally, did they meet with you when you? Well, they go, they went through a. No, no, but your argument, you met with the secretary. Did you do what you had Secretary Pierce do? Did you meet with each of these companies and listen to them and their lawyers before they were terminated? I met with anyone who wanted to meet with me, including the mortgage bankers who were. Well, let me ask you about the demolition people. Let's stick with the question one at a time, because I want to go back to the notion that a specific administrative decision to terminate one particular company is something that the secretary ought to be dealing with in this situation. I'm asking you, did you terminate those demolition companies personally? Did you meet with them and then, I mean, d decide to terminate them? I cannot now tell you, Mr. Frank, how many of them or if any of them I met yeah, okay. with. I, my guess is probably none because I don't I think wouldn't that's guess a that. I really, if you want, I'm, I'll tell you. May I make a recommendation, a fair recommendation to this committee? The Inspector General who served with me in 1974 and 75 also served with the throughout the Democratic administrations and into Secretary Pierce's administration. I think that you would find it useful to, to talk to an Inspector General who has served throughout the course of both Democratic and Republican administrations. But I can only represent to you quite fairly that I did meet quite frequently with companies affected by HUD rulings. Let me say, Madam Secretary, meeting with the Tech General, frankly, sure. I don't think it has any relevance to anything you and I have just been talking about. And I've talked to Inspector General and will continue to do so. The conclusion is all the clearer to me now. You were not doing much legal business with DRG. They had their own in-house counsel. They also had other counsel. Your firm was asked to represent them when they had basically exhausted their administrative remedies at HUD. They had gone up to the assistant secretary level and been turned down. They had been hit with pre-commitment. At that point, they hired you, and the consequence of that was a meeting with Secretary Pierce, and Secretary Pierce's decision to reverse two assistant secretaries and the professional people. And the consequence of that was, as we've just learned now, that they got a letter from Pierce which within a couple of months they were complaining about. No one had any responsibility to make them live up to that, apparently uh, outside, and uh, the further consequence is that we are here today. Well, someone did have the responsibility to make them live I, up to not, it. Not you, I mean. Absolutely, and yes. so the secretary stated. He stated quite uh, unequivocally in his letter that there would be an audit of on a loan by loan basis and were there any violation of the of right. the line of his nine page letter or the regulations but they or the handbook back and and basically get out from under and my point is this this professional staff and i think we ought to be very explicit about this the professional staff having lost that battle after your intervention my guess is was much less willing to keep up the battle when you make this fight and the two assistant secretaries and the professional staff are overruled by a secretary who paid very little attention to detail. They're overruled by that secretary who one week after being called by a former secretary gives a meeting and within a 10 days is writing a letter of this sort. And then after the people get the letter, they begin to complain about it. I can well understand why the HUD professional people having been overruled by the secretary in what seems to me an unusual fashion uh, were not as diligent as they had been before. They'd been that route, and I think that this set of circumstances helped explain why we had the problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Mr. Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, ask Ambassador Hills to uh, actually complete an answer to a couple of questions here, and then I'd like to go back and reestablish perhaps where we are uh, at this point because I, I respect your request of us to deal with things in an orderly fashion, and I'd like to try to perhaps summarize where we are right now. Uh, Mr. Frank uh, just talked to you about the nature of the representation of DRG and, and your firm, indicating that um, uh, it was his understanding that you were not corporate counsel, you were not uh, uh, directly affiliated with, with DRG on the board or anything of that nature but rather responded to their request for representation when those requests were made. Is that correct? That is correct, Mr. Kyle. And as a result, when DRG was unable to uh, resolve the situation by itself, uh, it came to you for legal assistance. Is that correct? That's correct. Or they may have gone to someone else as well. I just know the matters that they came to us with. 
And the matters prior to the uh, uh, to the situation involving DRG and the Barksdale letter were all purely legal matters. Is that, that correct? is correct. When you were were you visited by the client then who described, I take it, the problem that they were having as a result of the Barksdale letter? Uh, they visited me with the letter in hand. And you saw that as a, uh, well, I should ask you how, how you characterized it, but you believed that there were some things that perhaps the department ought to do as a general proposition that would be fairer for everyone who was providing co-insurance in projects of that time. Is that correct? I believed in the first instance that the client ought to get a stipulation of facts. And there was, as the chairman has pointed out, an aggressive bill of particulars presented by Mr. Barksdale. And I asked the client to meet with HUD to try to get a stipulation of fact because the client was saying these facts as stated are not correct. That to each one of these assertions, and I know it's been scattered through this morning, uh, there is a response. We have our side of the story. Not unlike any bill of particulars where the accused says, but wait a minute, listen to me. And our advice was get these things fixed that are really broken and persuade HUD, take them by the hand and show them if in fact the, and with respect to the Georgetown apartments, there is no problem with the repair escrow, let's get that one off the table. So we researched the law on what are the rules with a repair escrow and they were dealing with the facts as to whether or not the repairs were done. You follow what I mean? And that's how the, uh, uh, we were working with it. I thought that, uh, uh, that if they could deal with these six acts on, or these six actions on these three projects, which were the totality of the Barksdale concern, and put in loans in accordance with the Barksdale proposal of preclearance for 90 days, that by the time of 90 days was up, that they m could perhaps move ahead like any other co-insured, uh, co-insurance lender. Keep in mind, this is a new program. They put in, as the chairman pointed out, three loans and how to prove them. And then you have three projects where there are six violations of regulations. Then they put in six more loans and HUD approves them. So they're doing something right and something wrong. And we wanted them to fix those things that were wrong because even on the statement of you are now required to pre-clear your loans, that's not a permanent status. It cannot be a permanent status, in fact, because HUD either has a co-insurance program or it terminates the bad actors. A preclearance uh, really does competitively hinder the company. And as I was trying to explain to Mr. Frank, the government has an interest that it's, colli it's colliding here. They wouldn't have put the coinsurance program into effect unless they wanted the benefits that came from private underwriting. And so when they put someone back into preclearance, which is 100% uh, we'll do the underwriting mode in a certain sense, uh, and they thereby weaken the company, they create a company that is less able to do the service that they wanted them to do. If I could just interrupt right there. Preclearance, in other words, requires the agency itself to do all of the review and the consideration, the evaluation and, and determination up front something which the co-insurance program was designed to avoid. Is that I think correct? I, I think I misstated that. They, they would still be taking the file that the, uh, the lender had and they would be going through it, but before the commitment process, they would then say, you may do it. it now, if you, but the, the thing I was trying to say is when we had 100% insurance, I, there was a school of thought that the government did not have enough people to move fast enough to let the, the, the program work well. And so if you go into the preclearance, you go back to 
the stalemate where maybe loans won't get processed quickly enough to work within the marketplace. So you lose something. When you uh, requested the meeting of the secretary, did you do that uh, by picking up the phone and calling him or by writing a letter? I wrote him a letter and set forth the facts uh, of the case, the issue as I saw it, the problem, this collision between uh, uh, the company's competitive stature and its, weaken its weakening that I saw well, over time versus the regulatory problem that HUD saw and asked for a meeting and said I would be calling his office. My usual approach is to send a letter in so you know what it's about and then say I will call your office in a few days after you've had a chance to read the letter and request a meeting. Now, perhaps some other things that have been said here this morning might have created a misimpression. Uh, misimpression. Did you argue to either Secretary Pierce or at the first meeting that DRG should be permitted to have some certain kind of treatment because of their financial situation, something that you would be representing to either of these two parties? Not at all. Not at all. In fact, you know, the overruling of the staff puts a certain spin on the facts, and, and I understand uh, that, but we were searching for a method of getting guidelines that would cause the program to work. There were two big lenders in the program and a few others, and I cannot now tell you that what the profile of the industry was. But when I met in February with Mrs. Weissman, the effort was to try to develop something so that the HUD would not get the loss. We could get broader guidelines, and we tried to work on that. That would have corrected the competitive uh, unbalance between uh, DRG and others in the industry. And this was something that Mrs. Wiseman wanted to pursue and did in fact pursue with her staff, is that correct? That, that is correct, and with the DRG. They form uh, a working group, if you will, with DRG people and HUD people to explore whether we could more mechanize underwriting standards, whether you could create a formula so at the end of the formula, you would know that this loan was a better loan than, than if you didn't have the formula. And that's very difficult because there's so much subjectivity in underwriting and they never really quite got it done. And particularly in the time frame that you were concerned about for your client, uh, that problem simply could not be worked out. Well, at the beginning we hoped that it could be done in a matter of weeks because these people on both sides HUD and DRG had worked so closely together since November, but it turned out again I was wrong. They didn't come up with broad guidelines and there weren't criteria that seemed to be satisfactory that could solve the, the competing problems. Let, let me get back now to the other question concerning the financial status of uh, DRG. You indicated that, that that was not what you were arguing at the first meeting with Mrs. Wiseman and staff, uh, nor was that the basis for your argument to Secretary Pierce. Please, please tell us uh, the extent to which uh, you discussed in either of these two meetings the financial status of DRG. I don't believe that was an issue. It certainly is not in my recollection. Nobody suggested that DRG was thinly capitalized because there were rules as to the amount of capital that you had to have to be in the business. And that's a regulatory rule. I suspect if they were below capitalization, they, they would not have been eligible to be in the program. So their financial capability was not an issue, and I don't recall it. At, oh, certainly, Mr. Chairman. Is it not true, Madam Secretary, that the initial capitalization requirement was a million and a half dollars? And beyond that, there was a 2% requirement for loans made. So if in fact the loans were very large, as the Colonial House loan was very large, they had a million and a half capitalization, plus 2% of the loan, then they could not have assumed the 19% private share of that loan risk. Mr. Chairman, if I can take your question as a hypothetical, I'll agree yes. with it. I don't, uh, I mean, I don't have the facts. I don't, we did not discuss, to my recollection, 
uh, anything about their financial capacity no, at these I'm meetings. No, but I'm making a generic point that yeah. if the capitalization requirement to participate in this coinsurance program is to have 2% of the loans, when in fact the private company is supposed to assume 19% of the risk, and there is an initial capitalization of a million and a half, once you get into the $50 million loan range, the capitalization is not sufficient well, in the case of a default to take care of the private coinsurer's financial responsibility. I'm not blaming you for it. I'm merely stating a fact. Well, I would not want to take such a narrow view. I think we need to get someone in uh, who has more knowledge than I. They derive fees from their business, substantial fees, every loan closed. They would re it would get a fee, That's right. and they had other. And I mean, I just cannot tell you what the cash flow was or why one would go into this business. Quite honestly, so I don't know whether you can look at it in terms of the million and a half plus two percent and say that that's all they had as their on their balance sheet. I suspect not because it doesn't sound like a very good business. Well, the final outcome clearly indicates they were not, ad not adequately capitalized because they're in bankruptcy, as I understand. Well, as I say, you have, uh, you are right by virtue of the facts. Of what happened, exactly. That's right. I Mr. thank my Mr. Friend. Chairman, I wanted to follow up on this, but Mr. Shays wanted to make a point as well, and I'll yield him for a moment. Thank you, um, Madam Ambassador. I'm, I'm getting a little confused here because it's my understanding coinsurance didn't happen until 1983, which was after you were, uh, long after you were secretary. So you didn't, you didn't recommend coin. You 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 seem to be somewhat of an advocate of the concept, but but clearly, why you were secretary, you didn't advocate coinsurance. Is that not correct? I mean, you were, did you? Was this coinsurance a program that you initiated? No, okay. it was not what I initiated. But I certainly had talked to groups about it. We worried. I had a terrible problem in the mid 70s with foreclosures of insured multifamily projects, and co-insurance co was a, I'm just a multifamily to... project, and I am sure that I talked to DRG and uh, in, in the 1981 to 1983 about co-insurance. I am sure I even gave speeches about, uh, wouldn't this work? I, I don't, uh, it was no secret. This was in the literature. I guess the point I'm just trying to be clear in my own mind, because you become now such a defendant of co-insurance, it's my understanding this was a program that was adopted by Congress. And it's my understanding that it was a program, and, and if I'm wrong, maybe one of my colleagues here can straighten me out, maybe Representative Morrison. But I, I'm getting a little confused following this dialogue. My understanding is this coinsurance was adopted by Congress and that the administration had to implement the requirements. And that, um, I don't know if this was done through regulation or legislation, but it seems to me that whether it was a million and a half and then 2% per, per uh, participant, it was the same for all the participants. If, if, uh, That's I'm correct. Yield for a yes, second. I, I don't want to get too far off the point Please. here, but I, I think we're on an important point. I'd be very, to Mr. Morrison, is that who you want, Mr. Chairman? Well, I just wanted oh, to, to make a factual to, to, to observation either. that uh, the program was authorized in 74. It was implemented in 83. My understanding was that the 223F multifamily program was authorized in 73. That meant that, an that a company uh, could make a loan on a multifamily existing home or existing project, apartment project. But that coinsurance was not authorized until I think Mr. Shays is correct, uh, the mid-80s. And it came about because there was a notion, and I could be wrong in this, I'm just telling you what I believe to exist. I haven't thought about insurance for 10 years. Uh, but that there was a notion in 73 that the federal government could not adequately uh, underwrite those multifamily projects, insurance on multifamily projects, and they were giving FHA loans to them. <clears throat> so that it moved up to the notion that they would go co-insurance, but I don't think that occurred until 1983, and you're right, it, had, it required congressional legislation. 
But if you say that the roots of the legislation were in the 74 Act, I believe you. I just don't remember that. I'd be happy to yield. Just to respond to this, this point, my understanding, I'm not sure if uh, 223F was 73 or before that, and it was obviously a, approved along with other uh, situations in which uh, insurance would be granted 100 percent underwriting by, by HUD, but the, it's the Community Development, the Housing Community Development Act of 74 that includes the general coinsurance authorization, which is not limited to 223F, and it could have been implemented while you were secretary or subsequently. It's my understanding that it was never implemented for any program until 83, but the statutory authority dates from, from the 74 Act. I didn't recall that, Mr. Morrison. Uh, Mr. I'm not, uh, as you can see, I'm plainly, I fail as a mortgage expert. <laughs> Just one last point. If I'm Yield to Mr. Shays again, you bet. Uh, you, but the, the actual requirements of a million and a half, uh, two percent, um, that was something that was spread out for, for all the participants, or did it vary between participants? That's, that's part of the regulatory okay, right. uh, okay. implementation. That's not in the statute. The statute is bare bones, and I don't believe even the 20% requirements in the statute. I believe it's at least 10 is in the statute, but I'd have to look at it again. In other words, the statute is very bare bones and applies to the whole range of, of, uh, of multifamily programs. I think the point that the chairman was making is that, at least in retrospect, we, we can see that these underwriting requirements may have been too low. In this particular case, apparently were too low, uh, not just for DRG, but, but for anyone. Uh, the point that I wanted to make is that uh, this was not an issue uh, in the legal representation of DRG at the time that you were representing them. Is that correct? That's correct. Ambassador Hills. That issue was not raised by HUD, uh, and you did not inquire into it. No, the issue that was on, our, on the table was uh, this regulatory problem. It stemmed from the Barksdale letter, right. and then it, it uh, grew from their running their business. Mr. Chairman, the reason I wanted to get into this, there. Uh, I listened very carefully to all of the testimony, and until Mr. Frank raised a couple of questions, um, uh, I had reached a conclusion about Ambassador Hill's participation in this project, and I wanted to be able to summarize that. But his first question seemed to suggest that uh, perhaps uh, Ambassador Hills was uh, uh, trying to suggest to the Secretary that because of the sound financial condition of DRG that they'd ought to be given some special treatment that that is absolutely not the case, it was never an issue, and that uh, and Mrs. Hills uh, has uh, responded to that, I think, adequately. The other question uh, was a question that Mr. Frank raised, but I, I think possibly these were the, the, the question and the answer were not directly meeting, and it had to do with whether or not a hearing before the secretary would always be required for someone to stop doing business with the government. The question was asked in a rather general and hypothetical way, and I think, Mr. Chairman, that Ambassador Hills was trying to answer this in the context of a situation like this co-insurance situation, which involved the biggest co-insurer um, uh, in the entire program, uh, where there was a specific procedure for termination and which presumably, and I'll ask the question now, um, in something as serious as that, where the largest insurer in the program two of them comprising 95 percent of the total is being terminated, whether that wouldn't be an appropriate subject for the secretary to review. And it seems to me that under those circumstances it is, uh, but that's something different from saying that any time anybody has ever been doing business with HUD, before the uh, department says they can't do business with them anymore or terminates a program, they have to have a hearing with the secretary. Those are two totally different matters. I'd like to have Ambassador Hills expound upon that, if she would. Well, you, uh, you have done a better job than I. You're, I. I couldn't be more clear that when their serious issue affects uh, business or an individual, that uh, I, as secretary, would certainly hear them out. And I was trying to say that I met with lots of different entities. I used to think that HUD had about 65 groups that were affected by, by HUD's regulations. You cannot just say the financial groups. You have to say the savings and loans, the commercial banks, the savings banks, and you can't even say the savings and loans because there are two savings and loan associations, the large and the small. Uh, the, the mayors and the consumers and so forth, and it just goes on to a long list. And what you do affects people, and they want to come in to talk to you about it. And my door was open, and I saw lots of groups. I certainly would have seen DRG were I secretary. 
So I, I, I can tell you that. I would I have seen a company that was a very big player in the one coinsurance program that we have, and if they were to be uh, terminated, that in effect either terminated our program uh, and I would want to know what the issues were. I would have been that much of a hands-on manager. Yeah, and Mr. Chairman, I think it's important too that the first meeting that was requested was not with Secretary uh, Pierce, as was the case with some other people who have testified before this committee, but rather Ambassador Hills uh, uh, met with the staff, uh, as I think we all deem to be appropriate. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd like to review what I think we've established thus far, getting those two things out of the way. Um, and that was that Ambassador Hills was retained as a lawyer because of her expertise. It wasn't because of any kind of political um, a power that might be uh, possessed here. That she began by addressing her uh, efforts to the HUD staff, the professional level people who were supposed to resolve these matters as best they could. And uh, that the meeting was not just a one-on-one -on -one meeting, but included a whole variety of staff people. That after considerable time and work, um, the uh, resolution that was offered by the staff uh, was not one that her client felt that uh, it could live with competitively, uh, ask for further assistance, as a result of which Ambassador Hills did appeal to the Secretary, but again in that matter, wrote to the Secretary first um, and did not attempt to meet with him on a private or individual basis, but met with an entire room full of uh, staff people uh, to talk about this matter in a lengthy way not a political way, but based upon the merits of the case. Um, and that uh, when the uh, secretary's letter came um, and the bill to the client was sent, it was sent based upon a typical legal hourly rate in a manner consistent with uh, that which is used by the, law, the good law firms in the uh, country, and uh, that it did not represent a huge uh, consulting fee like some of the others that we have seen. And that Secretary Hills, as a matter of fact, even uh, uh, recommended to her client that the letter that was received from Secretary Pierce uh, was, in a sense, perhaps a more serious situation than existed before, because, in effect, Secretary Pierce was saying, all right, I have now deline delineated in writing the problems that DRG faces, and you either have to fix these problems or we're going to begin termination proceedings against you. Exactly. And that's the end of the ballgame as far as DH, DRG would have been concerned. So, Mr. Chairman, my, my point in trying to provide this summary is that we've had before us a, a variety of witnesses who haven't come off very well as far as their uh, ethics and standards are concerned. But for someone who is uh, in the administration now, uh, was a uh, prominent member of the bar uh, before her most recent appointment, and who so ably served the Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, before as secretary, it's important that we not leave the impression at the end of the day that because uh, we asked her to testify before us that there is some suggestion of wrongdoing or impropriety or uh, ethical misconduct on her part. And from everything that we have heard and what I have established, which I think you would agree with, um, I think we are uh, we can conclude that her conduct was totally proper uh, without uh, any kind of ethical impropriety. Certainly wasn't the influence peddling that we've heard uh, uh, from some others and um, it was totally consistent with the representation of a client by a member of a prominent law firm. Uh, Ambassador, if you would care to respond to that, you may, although I, I suspect maybe you want to leave. Well, if, if you'd like to respond, please feel free to do so. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the last thing I, I, I want to talk about, though, is just a little bit about HUD's relationship with DRG. Um, this is a bit more problematical, but I would suggest that ironically, at least at, at the time of Ambassador Hill's representation, um, and I think Mr. Frank pointed this out too, HUD uh, at the staff level did appear to be acting uh, relatively responsibly in this particular matter. Uh, the program was audited shortly after it began. Immediately upon the audit, DRG was put on preclearance. And uh, then after uh, uh, Secretary uh, Pierce wrote his letter, DRG was presumably at least in a situation where they either had to put up or shut up. 
Uh, at that point, Mrs. Hill's uh, representation ceased, and we're going to have to call upon others to get the rest of the story. And in retrospect, both you and Ambassador Hills have said that perhaps the program should have been terminated earlier than it was. But at least at that point, there was no uh, uh, suggestion, it seems to me, that the program should have been terminated. And uh, I'm not sure that we could conclude that Secretary Pierce's letter at that point was totally uh, bad policy, given the uh, suggestion that, that the uh, DRG would be terminated in the event that they didn't clear up the matters that he had put bef uh, before them. Uh, what happened after that is something that obviously we need to get into, and I suspect the chairman desires to do so. And uh, what may be suggested is that the underwriting requirements initially were insufficient, that perhaps there should be closer monitoring even than occurred in this case, that perhaps there was a mistake made uh, when DRG was taken off of preclearance, although that did, in fact, put the at significant competitive disadvantage. Uh, but at least I think I would want to agree with uh, Mr. Frank and with comments that you've made before that the staff professionals at HUD appeared pretty much to be doing their job in this matter, at least up to this point. And I think that's an important point for us to make. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think I am just... Uh, Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, again, I just want to commend Ambassador Hill for her candid testimony here today. Well, I want to thank my friend and colleague from Arizona, and I certainly agree with a great many things he said. Among those is uh, an observation I made earlier on that uh, being asked to appear before the subcommittee as a witness, ipso facto, implies nothing certainly no wrongdoing, and this, this, uh, we cannot emphasize this and repeat this long enough. The chair would take a somewhat different point of view than, than my friend from Arizona uh, on one item. Uh, we have now had testimony uh, from an assistant secretary on the record, Ms. Wiseman. Uh, we have had interviews with Mr. Barksdale. The letter of Mr. Barksdale speaks for itself. At the assistant secretary level, the request of DRG to have pre-clearance lifted was rejected. Now, it's perfectly proper for an attorney for DRG to attempt to obtain a review by the secretary, and uh, Mrs. Hill succeeded in doing so. The question I'd like to ask of you, Secretary Hills, is did you present to Secretary Pierce a different set of arguments that were uns than the ones that were unsuccessful vis-a-vis -vis Mr. Barksdale or, or Ms. Wiseman? Or basically, did you present the same set of arguments? I don't know that uh, we argued with Mr. Barksdale. Uh, we received his letter and urged the client to work with him and his staff to correct the problems. Well, with, you did have a meeting with, Ms. with Wiseman. Mrs. Wiseman. Uh, I made my presentation uh, of the competitive difficulty, and it may create a self-fulfilling prophecy, that is, a weakened company that would create liability for the government. And uh, she said, to my recollection, that she would prefer to have broad guidelines so that they would apply to all and that would take care of my problem of the competitive differential. Now, we didn't get that, but in... Well, there were existing broad guidelines. I mean, the uh, DRG was suspended, and what's put on pre-clearance requirement, because they didn't meet the guidelines. So this was not a question of creating guidelines. DRG failed to meet the guidelines. No. They, it... they engaged in what I would call an outrageous breach of their fiduciary responsibility on the part of the government of the United States, and therefore were punished by having the preclearance obligation placed on them. Those were the facts. When you tried to have those removed, and Ms. Wiseman, on the basis of her professional staff's advice, rejected that request. Well, Isn't that accurate? Uh, let me be a little more clear. When I met with Mrs. Wiseman, 
several of the problems that Mr. Barksdale had identified had been corrected. It was a moving target. HUD had approved six loans. So that the question before the, at the Wiseman meeting was, have they done enough in the way of correcting the bill of particulars pre presented by Mr. Barksdale? Are you now comfortable? And if you are not comfortable, is there a way that we can stop the damage that comes from this competitive burden that they bear? But is there some way we that can work? competitive burden upon themselves. Well, we're I mean, not your phrasing, and forgive me for, for re-injecting this issue, the impression you are attempting to create, which I think is an inaccurate impression, that one company was suddenly saddled with a competitive burden. Not at all. There was a level playing field. All companies had the same rules. And DRG engaged in serious breaches of their obligations. That placed them in a probationary status. Those are the facts. Uh, Those I are am, the facts. Uh, Mr. Chairman, please, uh, I am not trying to create any misapprehension. You asked me a question. Did I argue the same case before the secretary as I argued before the acting assistant secretary? That's right. And I was trying to tell you what the agenda was before the assistant secretary. And uh, I don't disagree that the company had misbehaved and was being spanked. That's true. Thrashed, if you like, and you feel it should be strung up. I might agree, but I wanted to have the facts first. Then, th three months later, many of the problems that had been identified had been corrected, and in fact, HUD did not continue to fuss with the company, but did in fact pre-approve those loans. So the issue before Mrs. Weissman is, since you now have a level of experience, remember, to get into the program you had to do three loans. They had done six loans that HUD had approved. So was there a door back into the program? Was it nine loans? What should they do to get out of this problem? And she turned the focus, and I do think quite properly, to broader guidelines that would affect everyone because one of the issues was that other companies had transgressed in a similar fashion as had DRG. In other words, in soft markets, you may not agree with the appraisals. So if your problem with DRG is that you are exaggerating the absorption rate for rent up, and HUD should be worried about that if you had a broad guideline that said in soft markets where you have a very high vacancies, we're not going to take a post-commitment review. We're going to do a pre-commitment review. And that's what we were grappling with. So the agenda was much the same, except that with the secretary, we said, can't we get at this? Can't we do something that works with some broad guidelines? In other words, I proposed uh, a post clearance audit on this one-by-one -one basis coupled with the broad guidelines we had at that point been able to work out. The one I enumerated in my, in my letter, I believe, was in all soft markets. And you could take a, a figure where vacancies were uh, at, say, 30 percent or 40 percent. You would require every lender, because that's where you're going to have your problem, submit that loan and have a pre-clearance. So that was the issue with the secretary, is how do we blend all of these policies? It was kind of juggling different policies. And uh, he came out with a very strict letter saying, with you, Mr. DRG, I will let you try it one more time. But the tone I get from the letter is, this is it. One more time you have. I want you to abide by these nine pages, a, gu a guideline, and a handbook. One more breach, and you are out. I'll give you notice of termination, and you'll have your right to hearing. And that is how I saw it. I didn't see him as just saying, oh, forget what the staff said. It was just a way of dealing with these issues that we had been trying to deal with for six months. Now, by hindsight, it didn't work. But I didn't know that. I'm sure he didn't know that. Congressman Weiss. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Madam Secretary. Uh, 
you had indicated that you had re recollect doing perhaps one uh, piece of work for DRG before this particular uh, incident and, and situation. No, uh, I don't think that's accurate. I said I only have a clear recollection of doing one piece of work. Right, okay. I'll, but that, there that. were other matters to equal the 50 hours a year. Mm -hmm. I just was trying to depict the difference Fine. between 1981 and 1984. Quite frankly, when I came in to see the chairman, I did not even remember we had done the work 1981 to 1984, and I wanted to put on the record it was 1984 to 1986 because you and I talked about 1984 and 1985 because you're focusing my attention on coinsurance. In any event, the, uh, the, the first three loans, for example, which qualified DRG to participate on a pre-clearance, uh, uh, on a post, on, on a post clearance basis, uh, had been uh, performed by attorneys other than yourself or your firm. Is that correct? The the qualifying three loans which allowed DRG to get into the program with HUD. I don't know that. Uh, I would presume so because I don't have any recollection of that. Fine. Okay. And. Do you do you know the did you know the general counsel for DRG? I'm not sure they had someone called general counsel. They used uh, a firm by the name of uh, Boykin was in the name. I'm sorry, Colton and Boykin as their general counsel. And were the were, was that firm knowledgeable about about housing matters and HUD related matters? I. Uh, I think they were a more in loans and day-to-day -day business for an insurer. I don't know what their level, I would be presumptuous of me to say that they didn't know anything in any area because I just wouldn't know. Well, I notice that you're getting guidance from uh, people behind you. Uh, perhaps they would be able to tell you as to whether in fact those people were, in get, were familiar with housing matters. I'm just being told that they did know housing law. Right, okay. Uh, in any event, except for the general retainership uh, for the rent control situation in communities which had rent control and, 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 and firms were trying to come in with, uh, DRU was trying to come in with, with the co-insurance program, you did not, your firm did not have anything akin to the major involvement that you had with this particular matter, is that correct? I didn't hear your question. You, your have, firm had not, prior to this DRG involvement with the Barksdale letter and the meeting with the Assistant Secretary and the Acting Assistant Secretary and Secretary Pierce, you had nothing similar to that prior to this particular situation. The time records would indicate that our, uh, our connection with DRG prior to that was much more limited. Right, okay. Now, tell me then, why, in your judgment, that you, th you believe that DRG came to you on this particular matter after having received the Barksdale letter? I believe they came to me as a housing lawyer who knew housing regulations, and I hope they thought that I was competent. I worked with a partner in my law firm who was very bright, had been at HUD with me, clerked on the Supreme Court, and I think that it was uh, a choice of a difficult problem and looking for people that uh, they thought had competence. Right, and, you, and I assume that you believe that they looked at your experience with HUD itself as one of the bases for selecting you for this work, is that correct? I would not. Uh, 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 presume as to what the characteristics of their choice were, but I was a former secretary, and so that was one, uh, one thing on my resume. Well, would it be logical to assume that anybody who hired you or retained you would be aware of the fact that you were a former secretary of HUD? I'm sure they were aware. Right. And so when they decided to come to your firm, look, uh, let, me, let me ask a question. You had said before that they came to your office with the letter in hand. Is that correct? That's my, re well, it was certainly on the table. Uh, I was just trying to say that they came with, that, with this matter. Right, and had they come 
to reach out specifically for you to represent them at that time? I believe so. They weren't looking for the firm that you were a member of. They were looking for you. Is that correct? No, I think well, you I would not say that. This matter, uh, we used lawyers besides myself to do the analysis. No, and I, I appreciate uh, that, but I just asked, not, not who you used to make the analyses. The firm, DRG, when it came to your firm, came to retain you. They wanted you as their representative. Is that correct? If I had been a solo pac practitioner, I'm not at all sure that they would have come to me. They wanted me and my firm because this required legal analysis, legal analysis of the regulations. But we are speculating as to why a client chooses a lawyer. Well, I'm, I'm asking the question because it seems to me uh, that in spite of my, my friend and colleague, Mr. Kyle's analysis as to how your situation differs from the other people who've come before us, and this is not to cast aspersions on you, as far as DRG, as far as the client is concerned, from the totality of the recitation that you gave as to the kind of work that your firm had done previously for DRG, the, the circumstance under which they came to you, what you were asked to undertake, it seems to me that DRG chose you and your firm because of the very reason that, that they knew and expected that you had access to the highest levels of HUD. Would that not be a fair assumption to make? Well, Mr. Weiss, it may very well be true that uh, as a former cabinet officer, uh, I had better access than some. But I would like to believe that the access I had was, it, it was due in major proportion because I have a reputation as a housing lawyer that I think is a good reputation and that the fact is I have never abused the right of access. Well, I, I appreciate that, uh, but I, I think that it might surprise you to learn that every other high official, former high official who appeared before us or one in high government or political circles who appeared before us made almost exactly the same statement to us. <coughs> Variations didn't have exactly the same kind of experience, but about the fact that they were, they were there giving you the, the acting on the merits and that they achieve things on the merit. So that sometimes, it seems to me, it is possible to be used by firms. And I, the things that you spelled out, the steps that you took to try to prevent that in the immediate uh, period after your departure from HUD indicate that you were very sensitive to that kind of thing. And so it seems to me that in this instance, DRG was very, very precise and knowing in whom they, they were selecting to represent them in a situation which they knew required representation at the highest level of HUD and access to the highest levels of HUD. Do you disagree with that? Again, I uh, would hope that someone who had taken two years to serve as Secretary of Housing would not be precluded from practicing law in uh, Washington, D.C. I can tell you honestly that I think I have a very good reputation as both a lawyer and knowledgeable about housing. And I can tell you just as quickly that I have never asked for an action or tried to get a department, whether it be the Department of Justice where I served or at HUD where I served, to do something that I thought was inappropriate. I may not have all the facts. Hindsight may be perfect. But I didn't do that. Now, I don't know with whom you are comparing me. I don't know if they were trained and able lawyers. I don't know if they were experienced in housing. I have given 15 years in the housing area, an area in which I am enormously interested. Now, a client comes in and hires me, and are you suggesting that that somehow is inappropriate? I'm suggesting, Madam Secretary, that in the context of the HUD inquiry that we're undertaking, 
and what we have seen other firms do and what you recited yourself as to the nature of you and your firm's prior relationship with DRG in this instance, that the reason that they selected you was not just because of your housing expertise, but that they selected you because they knew that you would have the kind of access which could get them a hearing and perhaps a rehearsal, but certainly a hearing access to overturn a determination which they were very economically unhappy with made by the Assistant Secretary of HUD. That very well may be that that uh, played into their determination. I won't dispute the fact. I honestly believe that were I secretary, I would have granted a hearing so that I believe they were entitled to a hearing and more particularly if they were to be terminated so that uh, if they were to say we select you because we think that you can b get our case heard, I don't think that's inappropriate. Okay, now you had spoken earlier in your testimony about your theories about management. And I have no, no dispute with any of the things that you had said about having an open door policy, about making sure that the IG knew that in fact it was important that they had access and that you considered important and so on. How do you consider as a tool of management the knowledge of your subordinates to know that when they made a decision on the merits, that you will in fact back them up. When I was secretary, I always had those people in the meetings with me and would hear the full debate. Uh, I would uh, make the decision and call it as I saw it. And I would hope that my findings of, or my rationale would persuade them that my waiting was not faulty. You don't go to overrule your staff, but you cannot duck and always agree with your staff. Otherwise, there would be no reason to have a chief executive officer. And oftentimes, staffs have different views within it when cross-examined. If you go around the table and you question different premises, they come out differently. So I don't know that you can have a mechanical formula that says a good manager never overrules the staff. I would say it depends so much on the issue. Okay, so and here, I believe here you that have. some good managers will must at times overrule their staff, or they're not performing their ultimate function. All right, now here you have you you you've, you've taken pains to point out that the secretary, Secretary Pierce, in the nine-page very firm and harsh letter, said in essence, one more breach and you've had it, right? right. And you've, you've uh, also pointed out that uh, the six of the, pro of the loans that were pending as of November, between November of 1984 and May, beginning of May of 1985, had in fact been approved. And so, your, I assume that your conclusion is that they, the reason that you were right in asking the secretary to restore a post-commitment uh, uh, procedure was because the prior problems had been corrected. Is that correct? Do you believe that, it, that, that, was, the, that was a solid basis for your asking the secretary, in fact, to overrule uh, Ms. Wiseman and Secretary and, and Assistant Secretary Barksdale. I, th I certainly think that the fact that HUD had approved some of the loans and some of the the uh, faults had been corrected was uh, was evidence that something was going right. Uh, overruling, as I said earlier, is a okay. you know a secret uh, that, Assistant that's Secretary that I Wiseman that's that and I. I wanted, uh, from uh, Madam Secretary, because I, I don't want to drag out this any longer than I have to. But if you look at the Secretary's letter, Secretary Pierce's letter, yes, you may have seen a, that you may feel that, well, they, DRG had corrected some of the problems that were attendant to the earlier six problems that had been cited in the Barksdale letter. But then Secretary Pierce goes through a brand new litany of breaches. Uh, use of non-HUD approved personnel, 
financial analysis, rental analysis, uh, finds all kinds of problems, expenses, and in, so that those were all pending capitalization rates. All those were still outstanding problems, and as the chairman says, he then comes to the conclusion that in spite of the fact that there are still all these problems pending and outstanding, that okay, he's gonna go back to a post-commitment monitoring system rather than a, a pre-commitment uh, basis. Now, as looking back at it in retrospect, do you believe that the secretary was right in making that determination? Well, how can I say that on the basis of what we know now? Well, that's what I'm asking you. What, what do you think that he was right? Uh, based upon what we know now, with hindsight, obviously, perhaps a hearing for termination might have been in order if there was such evidence. Yes, but Madam Secretary, we don't have to go on hindsight. The Secretary spells out every single one of those problems the very problems which ultimately got DRG into the very problems that caused their present situation. So we have to go, go into, into knowing in hindsight, that's what he was saying were the problems at that point, and you're saying that, well, in hindsight, it didn't turn out right. But the fact is that even at that point, it wasn't correct. Well, of course, I'd be pleased to hear. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, the number of problems stated very poignantly and very uh, uh, precisely in the secretary's letter to Mr. DeFranco. Was that unusual, that number of uh, difficulties with a project? Uh, or are you saying that you've seen many other letters that contain uh, observations and criticisms almost as bad, that this did not seem to you to be that unusual, that terrible? I mean, I'd like to get a frame of reference on how this letter impacted on you when you saw it. It seems, you know, it seems rather devastating to me. I think Mr. Weiss has followed that same line of, of reasoning. It's just I don't know what other letters might have been generated during your, your tenure or follow-on tenures that were equally critical. Well, this is a fairly critical letter. Uh, it is as critical as the Barksdale letter, and there the, uh, uh, we had some counter evidence so that, and then HUD moved. So, although these were strict complaints, for example, using uh, non-approved uh, HUD em employees, apparently there was some use of people who had not had their resumes cleared, and there was a big complaint that they were dumped in HUD's lap without getting cleared. Uh, I don't know whether those 500 people were good people, and within a period of time, they would have been HUD approved. The secretary was correctly noting you may not use those people until you do have approval. So uh, but it was, was interesting that you ended been told up by using previously the same that you couldn't do it. I thank Pardon? the gentleman for yielding. Yes, I thank you very much. He'd been told he had. He, well, we, what he was saying was that we've told you before that you were that you were using people who were not on the approved list. This was not his first indication that they were using people not on the approved list. Isn't that correct? That's correct. Yes. Okay. Now, also. Uh, You've made some repeated reference to uh, the disadvantage that it was placing uh, DRG competitively, that, that there was some, some competitive problem that was, that was being created. Uh, at the time, I have a, a 1985 Inspector General audit, which indicates that it, on the basis of the 1985 audit, and I assume that it was even less of a percentage in 1984, uh, DRG had 38.6% of the market, and a company named York had 52.7% of the market. Uh, so that they were, they were being fairly competitive, but they were second, in second place, isn't that correct? I have not seen the IG audit report, but if you read it to me, I, I believe what you tell me. Well, it says, uh, 1985 IG audit, mortgagee DRG, number of co-insured loans, 257%, 38.6, amount co-insured, 1.5 billion, 
York it has a couple of other small ones. York, 351 number of co-insured loans, percent 52.7 percent amount co-insured, 2.2. Uh, so they were they were being fairly competitive, but they were in second place. They were the Avis at that point of the industry. Isn't that correct? Based upon you tell right. me, right? Yes. And. I quote to you now from uh, a September 26, 1988 uh, note to the Inspector General from the President of the Government National Mortgage Association at HUD, uh, from Mark Buckman. And it points out that, uh, well, I'm going to read you a, a this is in response to the, to the uh, 88 report. So in our view, there is no comparison in the performance of York and DRG. DRG has a terribly high default rate, a very poor history of mortgage servicing and management, very lax underwriting standards, poor accounting and bookkeeping, just to mention the major points. On the other hand, York has become the Cadillac of the industry. While it is not without its problems, we believe it is in a different league from DRG. The best indicator is our latest statistic on problem loans in portfolio. DRG, $485 million in default of $1.1 billion per portfolio, or approximately 44%. York, $90 million in default on $2.98 billion, or approximately 3%. Now, it seems to me based on that and based on the problems that the professional staff, the assistant secretaries, the secretary himself was finding in 1985. They all, in regard to DRG, saw a bad apple. They saw a rotten customer. And they were trying in every way possible to limit their access to the use of federal taxpayer funds in this program. And it seems to me that, that you, the problem that we have is that DRG found you, and yes, you had no way of knowing what the ultimate numbers were going to be, but as an experienced housing person, as a former secretary of HUD, you had to, you should have been as aware of the fact that this, this, these were bad customers from the economic potential perspective, as, as Mr. Pierce or Mr. Barksdale or Ms. Wiseman were. And yet, that didn't seem to enter into, into the equation. And I guess my question to you is, why? I simply was not apprised. You read to me a 1988 Inspector General's report and partially a 1985 Inspector and, General's report. And also report. the Secretary, Secretary Pierce's letter in which he details all the, the same problems. But Mr. Weiss, that was at the end of the day. I was retained as a lawyer. I presented my client's case. I was not the judge in the case. I am not responsible for the fact that DRG is, as you put it, a bad actor. I believe that the problems that occurred had the remedy been exercised that was specified in the Secretary's letter would have prevented at least some substantial portion of them. I believe you can manage problems like this. And the Secretary's letter so clearly states that if there is, that we are going to monitor on a loan by loan basis, give us the endorsement office. And when we monitor, if you violate from that day forward, any violation, any significant deviation from this letter right. or from other regulatory or handbook requirements, we will, we will immediately withdraw your approval as a lender. Right, but- I wasn't, if I had been in HUD, then you could chastise me and say, why didn't you follow up on that? I simply represented DRG in a case before the department in 1984 and 1985, that had, and, and that was it. But Madam Secretary, uh, you, you had said that what you were working uh, for, what you were trying to achieve with Ms. Wiseman, 
with some kind of general industry-wide approach to dealing with this problem. But as it turns out, not only doesn't that, that emanate from Ms. Wiseman, that doesn't happen from the secretary, because what you have is a resolution of the situation only as it relates to restoring the post-commitment monitoring of DRG, but no, no generalized formula along, along the line that you were talking about to provide additional safeguards. Isn't that correct? Yes. I wonder, Mr. Weiss, are you suggesting that when I got this letter from, uh, I didn't get it actually, it was mailed to the client, that I should have called uh, the secretary and say, you have rendered a bad decision, it's too good for DRG, and told my client that uh, I have just uh, uh, told the decider that, uh, that somehow they weren't entitled to this. I have to tell you that in 1985, I thought the remedy could be implemented. I thought it would work. But surely you don't think that, I mean, it would be an enormous breach of the canons for me to, call, to turn around and, and uh, work against the client. Yes, I know, but I, I just wonder what you think about the appropriateness. When you have an obviously bad Apple client who is clearly seeking to use your access to overturn a decision made at the second highest level of the department than being able to get that result because of your access. And for you to be able to just walk away from it and say, well, all I was doing was exercising my role as a lawyer. And I'm asking you in retrospect whether in fact you think that, that your, your conduct in this situation was all that it should have been for the program itself. I do, and let me respond yeah. because those are harsh words. You bet. And I say it so kindly. You say there was uh, obviously a bad actor. Yet why did someone who did not have the fact, that had the facts, why didn't someone at HUD tell me if it was such a bad actor? I don't get the Inspector General's reports. Those are confidential. I don't get FBI reports. Madam Secretary, no if I could stop you just that moment. Bad acting doesn't have to be necessarily somebody who is committing willful fraud or criminal activity. Bad actor can be somebody who economically is pushing the edges so that you, you can tell by looking at it that this is a rotten situation. I could not tell in 1984 and 85 that this was a rotten situation. I thought the company deserved representation. I think our society would agree with me that even were it a bad actor, they deserve representation. Secondly, you say they were clearly using my access. I don't know whether they were or they were not, but I can tell you then and I can tell you now that I believe they were entitled to access to the secretary at this point. Maybe I would not have decided if I had had all the facts the secretary had the same way, but based upon the facts that I had, I would probably have decided as the secretary did. And then you say that as a result, that, that they got the result because of my access. That shouldn't occur in a debate. The secretary in this administration and in other administrations have heard my presentations and ruled against me. Secretary Pierce ruled against me in the very next ma matter that we handled for DRG. I mentioned it, the contractual matter that arose out of the insurance payment on a Title X loan that had been sold. Uh, I did not always win when I made my presentation. I did the best I could for my client. I was acting as a lawyer. I can tell you I thoroughly researched the regulations. I tried to have the facts as they were available to me. I'm quite sure you're right that the client didn't tell me that he was a bad actor or it was a bad actor, but I do not look back on that and say I'm ashamed for re representing DRG. I am sad that DRG has had these problems, and I'm even sadder that the system that was set up to prevent these problems was not implemented. But I don't really feel that I am the cause of DRG's frailties or defaults. Just, just a factual question yes, I think is in doubt. I thought in reference to uh, Mr. Frank that you had testified on that second go-round with uh, Secretary Pierce. You, wasn't sh you weren't sure whether it was your firm or yourself that was involved in sending that letter. 
No. Uh, uh, I would say that in preparing for this hearing, I have determined that there were three matters that are three areas in which we represented DRG from 1981 to 1983, where I'm having a very difficult time recalling what we did. The bills were light. I have called. I know I talked to some professionals I'm just interested in the second. I don't know what the subject matter was. There is a speculation that it might have been on rent control. The second area of representation this? was this coinsurance right. uh, that worked through the uh, secretary's letter in May but I wanted to tell the committee that I was aware of a letter that went out from DRG in August that you apparently haven't seen that only documents that the client was still unhappy with the post audit clearance. You can say they are, they are, that it was ungrateful, but I just wanted you to be aware of that. The third matter was on this contractual interpretation with the general counsel's office at HUD uh, the secretary sat in on that discussion, and the question there had been about a 70 percent payout on the insurance. And you, excuse me, sorry to interrupt. You were at that meeting. And yes, you I were, was. That's and, the point. And I, I lost that case. Okay. If that gives you any solace. <laughs> Would you just, for the record, uh, in uh, earlier in the in the hearing, uh, you had uh, said that your best judgment was that that probably. Uh, the totality of, of hours that you and the firm committed to this matter was about 150 hours, 125, 150 hours. Well, I'd like to be specific for the record Please. on the time frame. In the uh, first period, it was uh, roughly 150 hours from 1981 to 1983. Is that the period you were no, referring no. I'm to? I'm talking about from November of 1984 through May of 1985. I think it would be uh, in that range, in the range of 150 hours. Do you have records which indicate have you told I about? can get those records. Would I'm you? looking quickly and trying to add as you, uh, but I think it was between 100 and 150 hours for the November through May or June of uh, 1985. And what was the total billing during that time frame? We bill that, we bill the client at our normal hourly rate, and uh, I, as you know, the rates are covered by attorney-client privilege. I did call the counsel that's rep representing DRG now. I would normally not talk about our fees in public, but uh, I thought the issue would arise, and I have gotten clearance. I'm not comfortable about ca talking about it, but uh, I, we bill them. Um, what period are you interested in? I'm, I'm interested in the representation of the, from the period that you, you were retained on the Barksdale letter through uh, the, the completion of the representation before the secretary and whatever follow-up took place in 1985. I believe that for the, that matter, it was, uh, $33,500. And uh, I thank you very much. The, uh, you had you spoken about this letter that uh, was sent by the company, but you weren't sure, or were you, that, that who had drafted that letter. It may have been your office. It may have been done by the company itself, and you found out about it. Is that? Uh, there are three possibilities that it could have been done within our office. I don't have a recollection right. of it. It could have been done by the company without our office, or it could have been done by the company and our office reviewed it. And I just simply don't have any recollection of it, so I suspect that I was not, uh, that I was not the, I wasn't the drafter. I could have reviewed it possibly, but I don't have any recollection. Uh, are you aware of the fact that uh, sometime in May of ninth, the latter part of May of 1985, within oh two weeks of the me of the letter from Secretary Pierce, a representative of the Department of HUD made paid a side visit to the Colonial House Apartments in Houston, Texas, 
and found that this is the letter from which the memo from which uh, the chairman had read at the beginning, uh, talking about this Hawaiian party uh, premium and so on. Uh, the person who's writing it is somebody called Conrad Egan to Mr. Demery, Thomas Demery, dated May 24, 1985. And he says, I quote this part, as my questions became, question became more specific, the responses, the responses became more evasive. For example, how has your monthly leasing followed your projections? Answer, I didn't prepare the initial projections. Some months are better, better than others. What is your present physical and economic occupancy? Around 600 leases, I have no knowledge of the economics of the project. Uh, in any event, there was a great deal of unhappiness. Uh, no, next question, after seven months of leasing, shouldn't you have 250 more units leased? Answer, I don't know what the projections were. I would say we are under where we thought we'd be, but I think we will have a strong summer. Uh, and this is the person who's in charge of the promotion and the, and the, and the leasing program there. Did, did DRG or any of its people bring to your attention uh, within a matter of weeks uh, after that, the, the Pierce letter, that in fact the HUD was making visits to the site and was, was, was making life difficult for, uh, for DRG in relation to colonial houses. I have no recollection of that at all. Well, I would appreciate it if you could find anything in your records to refresh your recollection as to any further discussions that you may have had uh, in re but with DRG, conversations you had with DRG in regard to post-Pierce letter uh, activities, because I think that, that might be important for us to, to know what they complained to you and whether you were able to, you were requested to do anything in their behest. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Congressman Weiss. You have been enormously patient with us, Secretary Hills, and if my colleagues, uh, Congressman Shays and Schumer and Morrison agree, we'll take a brief uh, seventh inning uh, stretch. Okay. And uh, resume in a few minutes. Thank you. <coughs> Members of the House Government Operations Subcommittee on Employment and Housing are taking a brief recess. Our coverage will continue in a few moments. Good evening from the nation's capital. You're watching C-SPAN. Join us Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time for a live You Will Call In program. Our guest will be Senator Joseph Biden. The Delaware Democrat chairs the Senate Judiciary Committee, and he'll be taking your calls about the flag desecration issue. We'll return to today's hearing of the House Government Operations Subcommittee on Employment and Housing in just a few moments. Members are hearing from Trade Representative and former Housing and Urban Development Secretary Carla Hills about allegations of mismanagement and fraud in HUD programs. At about 3.15 a.m. Eastern Time, Deputy Secretary of Defense Donald Atwood is the guest at a luncheon held today by the Columbia Institute. He discusses cuts in the defense budget. After that, members of the Senate Impeachment Trial Committee Consider articles of impeachment against Judge Alcee Hastings from the Southern District of Florida. Judge Hastings is accused of taking a bribe and illegally using a government wiretap. He's been impeached by the Senate, and final arbitration on the case rests with this 12-member Senate panel. We then open our phone lines at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. Taking your calls will be Congressman Jim Slattery, a Democrat from Kansas, and a member of the House Budget Committee. That's a brief look at the schedule ahead. Thanks for joining us. As part of our 10th anniversary, C-SPAN acknowledges our viewers from across the country. This week, C-SPAN recognizes Mayor Dorothy Johnson from Appleton, Wisconsin. Ms. Johnson has been mayor of Appleton, population 65,000, for nine years. A news enthusiast, Mayor Johnson is also interested in jogging and spending time with her family. She watches C-SPAN on Cablevision of Appleton, a system owned by ATC. I like especially those times when, when I am given the opportunity of seeing congressmen as they are going about their duties, as they're interviewed individually, as they are working on the, the floor of the House or the Senate, as various issues unfold, as they meet in committee meetings. I think that, that all of that gives in-depth coverage to various subjects that are important to all of us as Americans. I'm especially appreciative of viewer input, the call-in programs, when people are given the chance to talk to our legislators 
or others who are in significant positions in Washington and, and uh, discuss in depth various matters that are, are of interest to all of us and that really concern the quality of our lives here in the United States and on this planet. My husband and I have often discussed many of the programs that we see. We feel that the interview programs are particularly important. And when the camera is on the floor of the Senate or the House and we see the in-depth coverage of committee meetings, we feel as if we're there and involved and participating in our form of government. And I think that it is very necessary not just to have headlines, but to have in-depth coverage, to have dimensions to those things that we, uh, we hear and that we see so that we have a, a full understanding of those things that are going on. I appreciate C-SPAN. I think it makes me a better citizen and a better mayor and a more informed individual. C-SPAN's look at American democracy is available to more than 46 million cable television households around the nation. C-SPAN is a nonprofit cooperative created and supported by the cable television industry as a public service to its national cable television audience. In addition, C-SPAN is underwritten in part by the following. What can you expect from a company named Bell South? Exactly what you'd expect from one of the leading communications companies in the world. Bell South. Everything you expect from a leader. Up next, we resume our coverage of today's hearing, focusing on allegations of abuse in programs at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Chairman Tom Lantos and his colleagues on the House Government Operations Subcommittee on Employment and Housing are hearing from U.S. Trade Representative and former HUD Secretary Carla Hills. long hearing and, and I know that while we won't spend as much on mod rehab there will be some issues that we're going to come back to and, and so uh, I hope not to be too long um, and I don't think I will be. I would first say that I think your statement um, and I, I hope I'm not saying this uh, just because you happen to be a Republican in the administration and I respect you for that but I do think that it was a responsive statement to the needs of this committee uh, and, and I appreciate having that statement. I do have one or two questions to ask, and, and uh, I think I would be doing you a disservice, uh, very honestly, since the allegations are out in the press, and you've wanted to come, and you've done it uh, in, with good nature, and, and, and want to deal with this issue, and then go back to doing your job, and we want to go and make sure we're focusing our attention in the right spaces, and the right, with the right people. Um, you clearly aren't a Samuel Pierce, you're not a Deborah Gordeen, you're not a Hunter Cushing, you're not a James Watt, you're not a Philip Wynn and a Philip Abrams who made $160 million off the taxpayer. You're not any of those people. Um, you happen to be a former secretary uh, who did a very good job. Uh, at least that's what Democrats and Republicans both tell me. Uh, you were in that office from 75 to 77 and then you pointed out in your testimony that you waited uh, at least a year and weren't even a lawyer and weren't doing lobbying and, and didn't get involved. Uh, some people, and you didn't have a law that required you to do that. Um, uh, there are many people who waited the limit when there was a law and then milked the system for all it was worth and you didn't do any of those things, as far as I can tell. Uh, but regrettably, uh, you had an impact on a decision and the decision ultimately uh, had uh, major consequences to the government and to the taxpayer. It may have been uh, uh, in part because you may have had a special uh, stature uh, as someone well respected and as a, uh, as a former secretary many years ago. Uh, it may be, and I think more likely, that um, sometimes I'm, I'm told that I can win an argument I shouldn't win and I become the loser because I shouldn't have won the argument. And, I think in this case, you may have won an argument that it's uh, unfortunate you, that you won. And, and let me put it in this perspective, and then I'm going to ask you 
two or three questions, and then I'll uh, yield to my colleagues. Um, three or four questions, maybe. Uh, in September, uh, we know that um, we know you had a meeting in February of '85 uh, with the career staff and Shirley Weissman, and we know that uh, a few months later in April you had a meeting with Samuel Pierce uh, and Deborah Gordine and some other individuals, and Shirley Weissman was not part of that meeting. We know that in September 10. Uh, 1984, there was, uh, we closed on the Colonial House for $47 million, $47.2 million. This is where I want to start out. There was an occupancy of 6%. There was a, a closure on September 10th, 1984, uh, at a value of $47.2 million. The IG, a few months later, October 29th, 84, uh, raised some very...